Hello, welcome to Remember the Film, the podcast that just came from Deep River, Ontario, and now we're in this dream place. Uh, my name's Josh Bradley, uh, back from hiatus, and I'm joined also back from hiatus by my two co-hosts, uh, Jeff Grizzolrich. Hello! And Hugo Panay. Hello, this is the podcast. We're this back. This is the podcast. <laughs> yeah, this is the podcast. This right here is the podcast. I'm pointing at a photo and saying this is the podcast. This is the podcast. <laughs> this is the podcast. <laughs> um, how long have we been gone, guys? Like, It's been over months? a month. Over a month? Yeah, yeah. yeah. over a month. We, we we started out saying, oh, we're going to be gone for two weeks. And then every week we had something else to do over the yeah, summer. Yeah, so it turned into a summer vacation. There are worse things we yeah. could have done. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's been oh, nice. Yeah. It's been nice sleeping in on Sundays on my end because I, you know, <laughs> peek behind the curtain. Peek behind the curtain. We record Sunday mornings in California and Sunday evenings in Italy. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So tough yeah, to Right now time. it's around 7 p.m. over here. So it's about 9 a.m. over so here. So it'll be about so. two hours until dinner time. Because that's how people in Europe have dinner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> More or less. Um, have you guys been like watching movies and stuff? I've been watching fewer movies in, in our hiatus, I think, because I don't have to watch them for a podcast. So I'm watching fewer. What about, what about you guys? I've still been watching like one movie a week at least. Mm. But certainly like compared to my you know normal rate of at least five movies a week, it's been a been lot fewer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, the same. Like, this summer was, uh, you know, I got my vaccine. Uh, we weren't having a lot of cases over here, and people are really getting vaccinated. We're almost at 70%. So, like, we've been able to really enjoy the summer and, and pretty much live almost as normal. So, spent a lot of the time outside after a year and a half of, of just being at home all the time, uh, which felt good. But still watched some movies over that period. I went to the theatres a few times. I did a big rewatch of Evangelion because the final movie was coming out. Um, and then what else? I guess I, I did go to see F9 with my little brother and Shang-Chi as well in theaters. Say we had um, my most anticipated movie of the year came out while we were on our little break. <laughs> and what did you think, Chris? I enjoyed Shang-Chi quite a lot. I, I really enjoyed it. And they did a lot of stuff with the Mandarin to fix yeah. that narrative. Uh, very, very happy with it indeed. <laughs> That's good. I still, I still haven't seen Shang-Chi. It's it's like basically a kung fu movie, and I really like kung fu movies, so it yeah, I had a great time. And I spent that whole week watching like um, martial arts movies. I watched Hero, Man of Tai Chi, directed by Keanu Reeves, which is a weird thing that exists. I watched The Raid Two that I hadn't seen yet. So yeah, and, and you got your Thanks. Matrix Four trilogy as well. Or, I'm sorry, trailer, the trailer, the Matrix yeah, Four trailer. Yeah, I got my Matrix Four trailer that I obsessed over for. Um, Three days straight. You and everybody um, else, man. You and everybody yeah, else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good trailer. It's a good ass trailer, isn't it? It was. It was a good trailer. My timeline on Twitter was just nothing but that movie for yeah. for days. Yeah. Pretty um, much. Not quite the splash of the Spider Man No Way Home trailer, but uh, no. close, I think. Well, but you know, like Marvel is at this point still the Marvel's biggest Marvel. thing in the, in, the in Marvel movies, culture. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing I've been watching is David Lynch giving daily weather reports on Twitter, and that's my segue <laughs> into <laughs> talking about David Lynch. If you oh, can't that, that should have been the intro. That should have been the intro. It's Friday once again. No, I'm not gonna do that. I will be doing my David <laughs> Lynch impression no more. We messed uh, it up. This should have been the intro. Hey, Coop. Good morning. <laughs> massive, massive amounts of pie. Uh, that's She's my Lynch. brother's sister's girl. <laughs> Um, so David Lynch, he, he wrote and directed Mulholland Drive, and I yep. think it's safe to say it's mm, among his, his most popular and most beloved works. Uh, I, I think I don't least. necessarily, I don't necessarily know if it's his most popular, because I do think, uh, Twin Peaks Twin aside, Peaks. Yeah. yeah, Twin Peaks is the most popular, but I also think that a lot of, a lot more people have watched Blue Velvet maybe than they have Mulholland Drive, just because it's like... It, it is a weirder film. It's also a movie, Blue Velvet at the time, a movie that, you know, had a bigger release. And I feel like people know of that movie a bit more. And they associate David Lynch with that idea of, you know, American suburbia and uh, what what's underneath the white picket fence. I have I a hypothesis. More, yeah, I think more so than like the sort of weird Hollywood movies that he made afterwards. My, my hypothesis is that if you are a David Lynch fan, you have watched everything he's made. And so Absolutely, nothing is yeah. more or less popular among David Lynch fans because that they've all watched everything he has made. 
Uh, I'm going to counter that just with my own anecdotal evidence in that I, I like David Lynch. Mulholland Drive is one of my favorite movies of all time, if not, you know, top five or so. And I've, yeah. I've not seen Lost Highway. I've not seen Inland Empire. I've not seen Wild at Heart. I've not seen, okay. I only just, I I've not seen Elephant Man. <laughs> I only just saw Racerhead for the first time like a couple years ago. And I, I don't really get Racerhead, honestly. Um, but I, I, I watched all of them. I, yeah, I've seen everything he's ever made. I've, <laughs> I've seen a bunch of his insane like short films as well. I don't know. There's that one that's called uh, "What Did Jack Do?" Where on uh, Netflix he, recently, yeah, he's yeah he, he interviews put it a on monkey. Netflix. He just interviews a monkey, and apparently it's the same monkey that played Marcel in Friends. For the monkey's some reason, still that alive. Monkey, I'm not joking. Yeah, the monkey's still alive, and apparently they use that monkey for this, uh, which I thought was funny well, as well. Well, he's a highly um, trained actor. That yeah, monkey, so. he is. Train, trained to stay alive, I guess. <laughs> has, it, has experience, you know. Um, so Hugo, I think it was you said that Twin Peaks is the, the most popular. I'm not sure that's true. I, I, I know that Twin Peaks mm. is very beloved. I'm not yeah. sure that makes it popular, though. I think people who watch it and give it a chance really, really get into it. But but also, I think I'd be willing to bet that a lot of the people who lo- watched and loved Twin Peaks have also watched and, and enjoyed Mulholland yeah. Drive. I think and. Uh, I, for me, for me, I think his three most, his biggest works are Blue Velvet, like you said, Mulholland Drive, and yeah. Twin Peaks. Not only do For I sure. think are those his most popular and most talked about works, but also like those are the best three distil- distillations of like what his shtick is. And Hugo, you just kind of touched on it. Uh, it is like the, the seedy underbelly of something that's sim- seemingly idyllic. That's like what Blue mm-hmm. Velvet is. It's like you know, it opens on like this nice, uh, like fifties esque neighborhood. Then they find an, a severed ear on the ground. You know, yeah, and, and same with stuff. Twin Peaks as well. Same with Very, Twin Peaks. You know, pleasant and, little town. Nothing goes wrong until everything goes wrong. And then there's a murder, <laughs> and it turns out there's a bunch of demons that possess people. And Twin Peaks has everything going on. <laughs> and then Mahal and Drive. Mahal and Drive is the same thing. Is this um, bright-eyed woman like uh, uh, Roger Ebert compares her to Nancy Drew, and how like this is mm-hmm. technically like a psychological thriller, and they're like investigating stuff, but like it doesn't really have the feel of like a gritty detective movie. It has more of the feel of Nancy Drew, and like. Yeah. The way she speaks and the way she looks um, is all very idealized, uh, idyllic, uh, for reasons that we'll later understand, I think. And uh, how it treats, like, old Hollywood iconography, again, kind of an idyllic thing. But then, you know, you get the seedy underbelly in a number of ways in Mulholland Drive. Uh, you get the seedy underbelly of, the ho- of Hollywood because you mm-hmm. see there are these shady mobsters pulling the strings, allegedly. Again, whether that's real or not, we can talk about. And then the other seedy underbelly is what the last 25 minutes of the movie are, which is kind of yeah. under undercutting the I- idyllic stuff we saw in the first, in the first two hours. So like I said, I think those three, um, those three pieces, Blue Velvet, Mulholland Drive and Twin Peaks all kind of get the CD and underbelly of the seemingly idyllic and the surrealism and the mm-hmm. horror um, and the comedy, like the farce, like that. Um, I-, I love oh, how yeah. much, how much like, ridiculousness there is in, in Mulholland Drive and like maybe the, the tone is a little dissonant but I, I, I think it works um it's yeah it's it's dissonant in a way that all most of David Lynch's stuff is that like the movies are you know borderline horror sometimes borderline psychological horror and at the same time there's really weird and uh, offbeat sense of humor in certain scenes that it, it they do feel um not of the same exact uh, tone, but for some reason, it, the, the level of weirdness is always so elevated in every part of his work that it sort of fits together, even though it shouldn't. It's sort of strange. Even just the way characters act in a lot of his movies is not necessarily naturalistic, so it is a bit off-putting, and that works for both the... You know, the, the, the thriller side, the psychological side and the comedy as well, which is something it's kind of something that is hard to explain. It's one of those you you understand it when you see it sort of things. And it's also, I think, one of those things, the tone of his stuff that uh, you either like it or you sort of don't. And it is a bit off putting. Well, I think that at least in terms of Mulholland Drive, the, the two most comedy, the two most farcical scenes, I think, are uh, we'll, we'll get to this in more detail later, but like the, the hitman. Yeah. The hitman, yeah. In the yeah. office building. Yep. And um, the director, Justin Throw, Adam Kesher, walking in with his wife with Billy Ray Cyrus, <laughs> Billy Ray Cyrus. of, yes. of yeah. all people. <laughs> um, and I, I think that the 
the comedy in both of those scenes is at the expense of the hitman and of Adam, the director. And I think that's very mm-hmm. intentional. Um, given like what is narratively happening in these sequences, it's kind of like so, a character in this movie wants to see bad things happen to these two people. And so that's why bad things are happening to these two people. So like that, the, yep. the, the comedy coming at their expense, I think is kind of, uh, the, from, a, from the point of view of a character and I'm, I'm kind of dancing around mm-hmm. Stuff yeah. at this point but i'm kind of defending like why those yeah, yeah. seemingly tonally dissonant things are in the movie and i think they actually work really well in the context of the story and even though it's not the tone you expect from something like this um i, I think it really works also like i think that hitman scene in particular is really funny i love the uh, hitman scene i i yeah. love the hitman scene <laughs> it's very, very funny <laughs> yeah um and really indicative of like what what lynch can do uh and mm-hmm. in, in that's kind that of thing. twin peaks is like that all the time like it, it goes from being extremely dark to very farcical almost in, in slapstick at, at moments yeah in <laughs> one scene from another like one scene it's like oh there's this killer and this girl full of blood walking down like the train tracks and the scene after it's like oh this guy is just eating donuts and then a llama passes through for some reason like <laughs> it <laughs> it's it's weird but so, in a way that i really enjoy so hugo just kind of said a few minutes ago that he's seen every lynch thing grace what about you what have you seen? I when? have seen Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. And All of I it? Have, I, uh, not, the, not the second coming. Okay, uh, then you haven't seen Twin Peaks then. <laughs> no offense. I'm not, not, trying to, not trying to pull your card or anything, but I, I like the first two seasons of Twin Peaks, particularly the first one, but uh, the, it's the third season. When David Lynch uh, was no longer involved and, and, you know, and so it doesn't count. He, well, the second <laughs> season, he wasn't, he wasn't as involved yeah. in the second season. And also, like, ABC, the network, made him allegedly like made him reveal who the killer was in the middle of the second season yeah. instead of at the end um yeah. regardless though but like the, the third season that was on showtime four years ago is like not only like the definitive twin peaks but maybe the definitive work of david lynch i think it is the definitive david lynch i think his the, his approach to filmmaking it it almost works better if you're doing a miniseries than if he do, is doing a film because the film there's always something that he doesn't have time to get to. And, and you feel, I don't know if you've seen a lot of the um, behind the scenes stuff where he gets angry at the producers because he wants to spend time on, on individual scenes more. I've, I've and, seen you know, some behind the scenes stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mulholland Drive itself, you know, we'll get to it, but it was thought of as a TV pilot, pilot initially because he wanted to do a miniseries. And a miniseries is the next thing that he's doing as well. Um, it, it it was just reported, I think, at the end of last year that he's working on this uh, project called Wisteria, or Unrecorded Night, it seems it might be called, <laughs> and which is going to be like a 13-part miniseries on Netflix, so, hmm. which cool. I'm really looking forward to. Well, as far as things I've seen, just Twin Peaks and now Mulholland Drive. Again, hmm. you've seen part of Twin Peaks. Like, I, I feel like the, the best... The best comparison I can give is as someone who's seen the prequels and the sequel trilogy and Solo and Rogue One, but not the original tr- trilogy. And they said, yeah, I've seen Star Wars. And I'm like, no, nah, you have, but you haven't. <laughs> like, you haven't, you don't have the, the complete picture or the best part <laughs> or <laughs> the most beloved yeah. part. Um, okay, that's good to know. Um, so I guess we've, looking at the outline, we've already talked about, like, what, what we've seen. Uh, mm-hmm. what our favorite things are, I guess. I mean, Hugh, what's your favorite? Is it this? Um, I, th- I think Twin Peaks of Return is, is probably my favorite um, as well. I, I, I really like this, though. This and, and that are the two things that really that I really enjoy. I also really like Lost Highway, which is something that fewer people have seen, but I think that one is is pretty great as well. I don't know what this says about me, but I've I've read... David Foster Wallace's articles on Lost Highway, but I haven't actually seen Lost Highway mm. itself. I don't know what that says about me. Um, it's it's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, that's right here. Yeah, Twin the, the third season of Twin Peaks is um, I haven't really wrapped my head around it. I've I've seen it like at least once, and I've seen a few episodes multiple times. I've been I've been like planning to just re- I have it all on Blu Ray. I've been planning to like rewatch it, and I just haven't found seventeen hours yet <laughs> to rewatch yeah. it. But um. <laughs> I can say just like even though I, I definitely don't get it what it's doing mm-hmm. I, I, I get a lot of it but not like everything um there's a lot of a lot of little strings that it's sort of the point though yeah. isn't it that it, you're not supposed it is. to yeah fully get it yeah but even if I don't like fully have a grasp a grasp on like what is actually happening I I, I do feel um 
the storytelling. Like the the setup and payoff in that is is wildly uh, satisfying, and mm-hmm. um, some of the the cinematic language is is wildly satisfying. So like, I I think I get it on a gut level and like an emotional mm-hmm. level, which is really impressive considering how perplexing some of the stuff in it is. And I think that's like a credit to him as a storyteller. Um, and bring it back down to, around to Mulholland Drive. Like I think I may have felt similarly after one watch, where like I didn't really yeah. have a full grasp of what was happening, but I at least emotionally got it, just because of his storytelling powers. Um, mm-hmm. I think I get it now though, because I've seen this six or eight or ten times at this point. Yeah, I think it, uh, after after two or three watches, I think Mulholland Drive pretty much clicks, and you understand what is happening, but. Just it, it is a common thing with a lot of his movies that or TV shows that it, it's it's kind of hard to completely understand the narrative. I don't think he even cares as much whether the narrative is a hundred percent complete. And it, it is you know he sort of just if you hear him speak, he always talks about oh I just had an idea for a feeling that I wanted to portray on film and. I did that. It doesn't really matter. You know I don't care if the mystery is a hundred percent solved. I don't care if there is a sort of specific headcanon of what happened or a timeline. And he always says, are you going to explain? No, I, it doesn't matter. I, I'm never going to explain because I want you, whatever feeling you have about it, whatever your interpretation is correct. That's that's his view of it. Yeah, the most the most common David Lynch meme that I see going around is from an interview he gave a few years ago at the yeah. Baptist where someone, he says, Eraserhead is actually my most spiritual film. And the interviewer yeah. says, elaborate on that. And he just says, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a quirky, weird man. Um, but we love him and his weather reports. I do. I really do. Yes. Uh, Hugo, would you like to take us into the boilerplate for Mulholland Drive? Okay, sure. So, Mulholland Drive. Um, it was. It's a surreal. Do you want to call it? What, what would you? How do you define the genre of the film? It's like a surrealist neo noir mystery, yeah. is what it says it's, on it's, on Wikipedia. It's, it's certainly neo noir, and it's certainly yeah. surrealist. So yeah, I think yeah. those two things are. It was released in October two thousand one. It it had sort of a. Re- we were looking at box office stuff before off uh, camera before very, recording. Very very strange box office. Very run, yeah. limited release. A strange box office run. I think it released more as a. Sort of an art piece that was shopped around festivals rather than like, yeah. I don't know. It, it's strange. What we were talking about before is that it it, it, it never was released on more than two hundred fifty screens, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, which is super small. That's that's yeah. tiny. Like nowadays, even five hundred screens qualifies for limited release nowadays, and this was only on two hundred fifty. Mm-hmm. And that's at, that was at its peak. That was in week three, and then, mm-hmm. but somehow it was still in theaters for three months. Or, yeah. Not more Very than three strange. months for thirty weeks, rather. And like nowadays, again, if a movie gets a six-week run, that's good. <laughs> Particularly if it's only on five hundred screens. Mm-hmm. Different time. And maybe you know the release could have been also just because of the production of the movie. It was origin originally made as a sort of a pilot for a TV show, um, and then there was you know the the executive at the TV studio rejected the project, and so. He was able to find funding from specifically, I think, Studio Canal, which is a, I believe, a, a European studio. I think it's French. Uh, gave additional funding to the to the movie um, to complete it, and so part of it was shot as a, as a TV show pilot, and part was sort of a, more shooting that they did to sort of wrap the film. I think maybe if it was a TV show, it would be it would feel a little more concrete in the way that that Twin Peaks sort of is, not exactly. Um, but what they did was basically give a more surrealist tone to it and 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 finish a story. Um, yes, Chris. I think it is very obvious that this was shot as a TV pilot for a good chunk of the movie. Mm. Uh, I think, especially in a lot of ways, a lot of the line delivery feels like people who are still finding their characters, uh, mm. and then and and we can talk more about this later because I do think that I, he does find a way to use that to tell the message that he wanted to tell of sorts. <laughs> but mm-hmm. uh, uh, in, in general, I, I thought a lot of the lines were kind of flat uh, and, uh, you know, especially in the beginning parts of the movie, which is why I think he, that, that serves his narrative. But uh, uh, right. on top of that, also just the way it's so disjointed uh, from what, like he jumps from one thread to another very quickly. Uh, I think that's something that you would see more in a television show than, 
in a movie mm-hmm. where you had a set path that you wanted to, to go down. Uh, I think, okay, so I understand what you mean, but also if, if you watch a lot of David Lynch movies, the line delivery is always pretty strange. Like it's never, I think it, there's, there's definitely a reason for it here. Like there's a narr- there's a narr- narrative reason for why the lines are delivered in a strange way. It's also, I think, something that he just likes to do. He likes to have overacting. He likes to, if you see, there's some videos of him directing where he's telling his actors to do something that you wouldn't traditionally ask of an actor to yeah. do. And so he, he does like that big over-the-top performance and, and or even not over-the-top, just offbeat is something that he does a lot. And But at the same time, if you ju- just see this, I understand how you can sort of get to that conclusion because I'm, I'm sure it's part of it as well. I'm sure what was the pilot was then reworked into a, a different narrative that utilizes uh, sort of the tone that the pilot have. But I do think there's a reason as well in it. Yeah, I guess I, I, and I, last yeah. night when I finished watching it, I was like, I don't think I get this. Uh, but right. I thought about it some more and I, I'm pretty sure I, I get it and I'm hoping that there's more to it and that you guys are going to mm-hmm. enlighten we'll me see. and my entire outlook on it is going to change. <laughs> who, who are you talking about specifically when you talk about the line reads being a little off or weird? Oh, well, I mean, it started. It started with uh, what uh, Denise? No, no, Betty. 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 That's Betty. Looking. Yeah, Betty is at the time. For. Yeah, it was Betty. Naomi uh, Watts. Yes, Naomi Watts, yes. and yeah. that's I can fully, I, I I grasp why her lines are so like. Jiminy Jillikers, oh, mister, yes. it sure is yeah, great yeah, to yeah. be in Los Angeles. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that just be the day? You yeah. know, like that sort of <laughs> nonsense, right? So, like, yeah. I, I understand Naomi Watts's, mm-hmm. you know, lines being that way. But yeah. Justin Thoreau, uh, early mm-hmm. on in the movie, felt very odd. The studio directors. Uh, another example would be the inclusion of several characters that are introduced and then immediately discarded. <laughs> who who besides the cops? The cops are the only ones I can think of. Uh, I, I forget his name. He's the guy who he's in everything. Uh, the uh, oh god, like what is? His, I'm gonna look it up real quick. What's his role in the movie? I can. Uh, he doesn't really have a role in the movie. He's in the diner. He, he's oh <laughs> he's yeah, talking yeah, about how okay. he has he had okay. dreams. Yeah, 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 the dream yeah. guy. He had a dream. The guy, the guy who the yeah, the guy who encounters the man behind Winkies. Yes, and collapses. And, okay, and and then the guy who's with <laughs> the man. Who encounters the yep. man behind Winkies? <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely have a defense for that scene. Okay, um, well, you know, sure. I, I look forward to hearing it. We'll but, get to uh, that. Because we'll it to is it. like, we'll like you know, I we, thought, we oh, need... okay. When I see these guys yep. and the cops, I'm like, okay, this is this is the part that feels like this was for the TV show. We're going to see a lot more mm-hmm. of these guys in late, later episodes. But then when you have to switch to tell you know tell the story of a movie, there's a lot of stuff that has to go by the wayside. Uh, including those characters almost entirely. <laughs> right. Okay, let's finish with Boilerplate and then we'll get into the specifics of different scenes. So the film debuted at Cannes, at the Cannes Film Festival, and David Lynch was given the Prix de la Mise en Scène, which is uh, the Best Director Award, basically, at the Cannes Festival. He shared that. He wasn't. He didn't uh, win it alone. They gave it to Joel Cohn, Cohen as well. For the man who wasn't there, it's interesting that they said that they gave it to Joel Cohen. They say, is it because they can only give it to one person at Cannes? Is it some sort of rule? Because I'm sure the man who wasn't there was directed, of course, by both brothers, right? Do they switch around who gets the director credit? No, it's just like for the first like fifteen or twenty years they were making movies, uh, they were credited only to being directed by Joel, but written by right. both of them and produced by both of them. And then like in the two thousands, they started doing a co-director credit. But right. then they also kind of like retroactively gave Ethan director mm-hmm, director mm-hmm. credit on the earlier movies, even though when they came right. out, they weren't he wasn't specifically credited. I don't know if that was a DGA issue because like DGA yeah, DGA Directors Guild has weird rules about co directing. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that was it. I don't know what the rationale was, but like yeah, if, like if you watch Fargo right now, uh, new addition yeah. to the poster wall behind me for those watching on video, um, Fargo is dire- directed by Joel Cohen. It's not directed by Joel and Ethan even though yeah. it was directed by Joel and Ethan. So, like, mm-hmm. it's probably that, is that, again, the first, like, 20 years they're making movies, Joel was the only director credited, but that was retroactively changed. Lynch was also nominated for Best Director at the 2002 Academy Awards, but the award went for, to Ron Howard for A Beautiful Mind, which, sure. Um, All right. Uh, uh, you know, it's, sure. Uh, it was the only Oscar nomination for the movie as well, which I 
thought was kind of surprising. I thought maybe Very. Naomi Watts could have could have sneaked into there at least. Um, also, the cinematography I think is 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 absolutely stunning, especially on some of the stuff they do later on in the movie. The music, the music as well is fantastic yeah, by Angelo a, Badalamenti, of thing. course. Uh, they work together on a lot of stuff, right? Like that. He also that, did Angelo the Badalamenti Twin Peaks is, music as well. Yeah, he's worked on almost all I think of David Lynch's movies. Did he do the Twin Peaks music? Am I, am I crazy? He did yes. Okay. Good. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that was another thing. I was like, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, this is yeah, the similar vibes to Twin Peaks. I didn't love yeah. the music in Twin Peaks either. So. Right. You're crazy. Okay. You're crazy. <laughs> I think the music. I think the music is fantastic. It's in amazing. This. Um, it. The film generally, by on a critical level, is often considered David Lynch's best film, uh, even though his most critically acclaimed thing might be Twin Peaks Return, which we've talked about. Um, Roger Ebert, who we often sign on the podcast, and who wasn't always the biggest fan of David Lynch. There were, there were quite a few films where that Roger Ebert didn't really appreciate, um, but gave this film four out of four stars and added, added it to, its, to his uh, great films list. He said of the film that David Lynch has been working towards Holland Drive all of his career, which I, I really agree with. And the movie, and he said that the movie is a surrealist dreamscape in the form of a Hollywood film noir. And the less it makes sense, the more we can't stop watching it, which is, I think, really encapsulates how I feel about the movie. Like the, the more it delves into the surreal, the more I find myself drawn to it. Um, even though, again, watching it a few times, you you start to piece everything together. Real um, quick, I want to... so. That was from Ebert's original review from 2001. Yep. He also added to his great movies list, as you just said, yep. which was like a different s- s- collection of essays, more or less. So this <laughs> is from this is from his great movies review, which is in 2012, and this is how it opens. And I feel like he's talking at you, Grizz. Just so you let's know. hear it. Lay it on me, Roger. <laughs> it's well known that David Lynch's Mulholland Drive was assembled from the remains of a canceled TV series with the addition of some with the addition of some additional footage filmed later. That may be taken by some viewers as a way to explain the film's fractured structure and lack of continuity. I think it's a delusion to imagine a complete film lurking somewhere in Lynch's mind, a ghostly director's cut that exists only in his original intentions. The film is openly dreamlike, and like most dreams, it moves uncertainly down a path with many turnings. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... So, Roger would Roger would argue that it's the narrative conceit of the movie to be disjointed and not a flaw from that. the production. And maybe this is just a little cynical of me, and by just a little, I mean it's very cynical of me. That feels very convenient <laughs> to me. That like, oh, I don't have to make a coherent uh, through line for for everything because that's the point is that it's incoherent. <laughs> well, <laughs> so. I, I don't think it's incoherent is, is the thing. And like later I'm in this... I'm exaggerating there. It's not completely yeah, no, incoherent. I, I, know, like, I, I know. get the movie. Like, and I understand that what happened. Later later in that <laughs> same great movie's essay by Roger Ebert about Mulholland Drive, he talks about how uh, he does this... He did when he was alive, R.I.P. Roger Ebert, when he, he did this yearly thing where he would go to, um, I think, uh, Conference on World Affairs at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And he did this annual thing where he would show a movie to like an auditorium full of people on day one and then spend the next like three or four days basically breaking down the movie scene by scene, sometimes even shot by shot, and like leading mm-hmm. discussions with that auditorium of people. And he said he did that with Mulholland Drive um, one year, and like they couldn't really come to a consensus on what exactly they thought the film was doing, but like everyone, you could still like break it down in a shot by shot basis over the course of like 12 hours over three days yeah. with a group room full yeah. of people. So like whether or not, you know. Whether or not it's disjointed, I think, is beside the point. It's, it still clearly works and can be read a number of ways by a number of people, which is, I don't know, why I think I which love it. Which kind is of, kind of the point, right, is that it's you're, spo- yeah. you're supposed to be able to pull something from this movie that I might not pull or that Hugo might not pull, but we might find something else that we that really resonated with us. And that is a, a hallmark of David Lynch's films, am I correct? That's something that he likes to uh, do? Yeah. To, like, it... There are at least two, uh, I would say three of his movies that are way more disjointed and strange and, and hard to follow even than this one is. Like if you see Inland Empire specifically is the one that is the most incomprehensible almost. But I think his idea is to always, uh, and I'm not saying that you're not following the movie. I'm just saying that has that disjointed, surreal feeling that maybe it is unsatisfying to you, which is completely fair. Right, and that's what I want to say is like just yeah. because I like you know, spoilers for how I felt about the movie, I didn't like it, but mm-hmm. that does not mean that the movie doesn't have value for other people. Yeah. And I want to make that abundantly clear that I fully respect 
that you guys really enjoy this movie. And so, like, when we're talking about things I don't like, I hope you know that it's, you know, it's not something... <laughs> I mean, I'm, take, yeah, I'm it, taking it to mean you personally don't like me as a person. That's what right. I'm taking it to mean. Okay, yes. good. So the, as long as we're on the You're same saying page, I don't stupid, like Josh. <laughs> and we get it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but so, like, I, I am hoping... And because, because you guys like this movie so much, and I knew going in how much you guys like this movie... I really did go in wanting to like it a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm hoping that while we're discussing it, that some things that I may- maybe I did miss something uh, and you guys will you know enlighten me to that and then that'll change my outlook. And then the next time I do watch it, because of course, I personally, I don't love a movie that you have to watch five times to start to enjoy. But, you know, if you guys tell me that's the, what you got to do th- and I trust you guys. Uh, not really. I, I, I really, I love this the first <laughs> time. So, it, you know, I, I think you... Yeah. If you really like it, then going back is rewarding for you. But it, if you're not into it, that you mean you're just not into it. That's I'm fine. just because I, um, David Lynch has so many movies that are on all these greatest lists of all times, right? And yeah, and I'm going to have to watch to these eventually. I mean, at some point, <laughs> although I mean, the and ones that are like usually them. on the lists, the the <laughs> ones that are usually on the big lists are less. I think I think more accessible at least. Than, so like than Elephant Man. Is... Elephant Man is his is one of his most straightforward movies. I I would say in terms of at least film structure. I th- honestly I think this maybe I'm crazy. I think this is pretty straightforward too. Well, like so that's what I'm worried like about a... is that I thought it was pretty straightforward, and so if right. there's supposed to be some big deeper meaning and and I didn't catch no, it, no, no, like yeah. r- relatively speaking, like I, I I haven't seen Lost Highway or Inland, Inland Empire, but based on those reputations, like those apparently are oh yeah far more like incomprehensible not... than Mulholland Drive. Inland Empire, Inland Empire is just. I don't know what and it is. Granted, I only I, saw... I enjoyed watching it, but I have no idea what... what I only saw Blue Velvet the one time, and it was like a decade ago, so I was like a young man, mm-hmm. and not as film yep. literate as I am now, but like, I remember being pretty confused by a few things in that movie, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like I said, Twin Peaks, The Return, like, I I adore it <laughs> yeah. and respect it, but don't certainly don't get it, everything. It, it um, definitely goes places, doesn't it? Well, see, <laughs> but, the reason I didn't go back to Twin Peaks, like, when they did The Return was because I enjoyed the first season of Twin Peaks and I and then it started to tail off in, in season two and then uh, and I just by the end of it I, I was like this is just weird for the sake of being weird mm-hmm. and I didn't enjoy that uh, and that was by that point Dave Lynch was not involved yeah right. so you know then when I think, we come back think... to it like I'm you know yes now it's David Lynch again but I have a hard time in my mind uh, you know, removing those feelings of how I felt about the movie, the, the, the show in the tail end, mm-hmm. you know, to go back and, and jump in fresh. I think, it, I think, look, it, it's a sequel to the first season more than it is to the whole of Twin Peaks. Uh, it, 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 there are some parts that you need from, from the second season, but it, it generally also feels like it's almost something that engages with what Twin Peaks is more of an on a cultural level than necessarily on a narrative level. I and agree. Yeah. So I, I think honestly you can you can just go in and it the tone is quite different as well. It's it, it's almost its own thing. It's almost okay. something I definitely think it's worth worth a shot if you find the time to watch it. Point is I'm not I'm not giving up on David Lynch just because I didn't love Mulholland Thank you. Drive. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. I, I recommend um, everybody watch Twin Peaks season three. Everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't care what your relationship with Lynch is. Everyone should watch it. Anyway, uh, Mulholland Drive, to just to finish up our boilerplate stuff, is was named the best film of the decade by the LA, the Los Angeles Film Critics Associations, by mm-hmm. the magazine Cahier de Cinema, by IndieWire, and several other publications, I'm as well name, as I'm, being... I'm going to name a few of those when you're done with this yeah, list. I got a few. As well, yeah. as well as being generally quite high on a lot of the... Uh, decade lists that you can find in, in, in many publications on the internet and in magazines at the time. Um, it is only, it's one of only two films of the 21st century to be on the BFI's 2012 Sight and Sound Top 100 Films of All Time, where so it is ranked at... What's the other one? What, sorry? The other what's one is in, in is Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for ah, Love. Okay, that another sense. really great movie. Um where uh, Mulholland Drive is ranked at number 28 on that top 100. It isn't, however, and maybe, uh, you know, maybe it, it indicates sort of the what a more general audience feels about the film is not, however, on the IMDb Top 250, and it's only at number 178 on a letterboxed top, 250, top 250. Even though, like, it surprised me because generally letterboxed 
has these more sort of quote unquote artsy, even though I don't, I don't think this is necessarily artsy uh, films quite high on their list. Um, but it, it, it didn't really, you know, get very high on that list either. So. so speaking of publications that put this at the top of their best of the decade list, Grizz, mm-hmm. this is really for you. The first time I ever heard of this movie was when we were both in college and a little paper called the ND SMC Observer named this the best movie of the 2000s, which is the... Hugo, that's the student the newspaper. That? It's a student oh, newspaper, student at newspaper Notre Dame. in Notre Dame. <laughs> and um, I definitely hadn't heard of this yet, but they 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 wrote a very stirring and convincing piece. And I think I I think I watched it shortly after reading that. I watched it for the first time. Um, mm-hmm. And the second thing, second anecdote is uh, BBC has a list of uh, best of the 21st century. Yeah, and I think it was I think it came out in 2017, 2016, 2016. But it's uh, from a poll of 177 film critics from around the world. Uh, it's a list I really respect. Number one, Mulholland Drive. Number two, In the Mood for Love, Wong Kar Wai, like you said. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Num- number three, There Will Be Blood. Number four, Spirit Away. Number five, Boyhood. That's a good top five. That's but a good list. That's a good list. A lot of variety there as well. Yeah, very uh, good variety there. Honestly, yeah. that that twenty best of the 21st century list is... Uh, I, I need to work my way it, through it. It's, 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 it's really, it's good really, list, yeah. really good. But Mulholland Drive is number one. Is my point. Mm-hmm. Yep. So yeah. Um. Now to get into the discussion, I guess we've already uh, given we're gonna, more. We're just going to go into spoilers of, right uh, off the bat here. Just, I'm putting yeah, up a spoiler warning. Okay, for sure. <laughs> and we we definitely have given some of our general thoughts, but maybe because uh, Grizz didn't like the movie, and we talked about some reason why. Um, I really love the movie. Um, I love it. I loved it the first time as sort of a this this creepy uh, Hollywood tone piece. Uh, even though I, the first time I watched it, I really could not put together exactly what the narrative was doing. But I love the way the movie looks. I love the way it sounds. I love the switch that you get with the first part of the movie being this like sort of big dream world sequence that has one tone. And then once it's it slowly gets weirder and weirder until we get to the real world. And then in the real world, the tone is even more disjointed and crazy and, and creepy. Um I, I think the acting is so perfect for this movie. Um, I I do like the way that you know the line deliveries are very different when you're in 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 sort of in the dream world and in the real world. Um, and also, I think again, I think the cinematography is really underrated, especially in in everything that has to do with the final thirty or so minutes. I think from when uh, we have the first sex scene on. So when and when they put the wigs together, uh, I think from then on the movie is so creative visually, and, and I think it's it, it looks absolutely stunning. The editing too. What the can editing, you guys the tell the editing? About oh, the editing is so good. The decision in some scenes to do handheld camera versus others, where like you have some scenes where it's kind of a shaky cam. You know, mm-hmm. is that was that on purpose? Was there you know, or is... I, I think so. He he often uses it as a technique. He uses. Uh, handheld to there's a common uh, visual in a lot of david lynch's work which is handheld camera for in first person going around corridors going around corners yeah. entering places giving you the viewpoint um, of the character yeah and also the camera coming from outside and zooming into a detail is something that he does a lot um the camera coming in and out of of fishes is also something else that he does which in this movie is the blue box which we'll, we'll get to i'm sure you see the camera going inside and then coming out and then it, it sort of it's almost as if he's literally showing you that you're being transported into a different dream reality. Um, and he talks about movies as this sort of dream experience where you for those two hours, you're sort of transported to a different world than that world, whether it makes complete sense or not. It, it's sort of a different reality to him and he, he likes to explore how dreamlike and how surreal you can get with that concept a lot when so. you say when you say handheld do you mean like the the point of view shots that we were just talking about well like i mean yeah some cameras? of that but also like uh i'm paying attention at the very beginning of the movie uh mm-hmm. there when you're coming up with the the limo is driving and you're following behind the limo mm-hmm. the camera is you know shaky there and yeah and i remember thinking like like was this a i don't 
was it a budget thing that they you know like they just did a handheld camera for for that for some reason or because I I couldn't find I a reason so. for why that should that scene should be shaky. I know that's a weird thing to like latch onto, but it stuck with me because Josh keeps conditioning me to pay so much attention at the beginning of these movies. So <laughs> that's not the opening shot though. Is it's it? not the opening shot, okay. which I did want to talk about the opening shot, okay. which is a bunch of people dancing. It's a jitterbug. <laughs> it's a jitterbug competition. It's a jitterbug competition. <laughs> um, okay, number of things. Number one. Uh, just to to use terminology, I don't, I'm not sure there is a handheld shot in this movie. Okay. A handheld shot is like a lot. Literally a handheld all, camera. Yeah. It, right, and like following a car on Mulholland Drive is not going to be handheld because you're not there's not a person behind the car as it's driving. Like, you know what I mean? Probably, I, I, I was more focused on the, the fact that the camera the fact that it was, was shaking. Shaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's an argument to be made about why that might be shaky um because like to your point like they probably shot that by putting the camera on the back of a truck or something and right. just followed the limo limo so that probably isn't happening because of production that's probably a conscious choice to make it okay. shaky in mm-hmm. post i would imagine and um i think that that sequence is the first one we get that's in a uh, a different reality than yeah. uh, mm-hmm. some of the movie takes place in so it could be in and, and there are moments where reality is kind of peeking its head into the faux reality so like i think mm-hmm. you could make an argument that the shakiness is kind of the the insustainability yeah. or the uh okay. unstableness of the Cause, of the facade because what i was thinking looking back on it because like after i'd realized that the first two-thirds of the movie is a dream state mm-hmm. after i'd mm-hmm. realized that i was looking back on that and thinking like you know my dreams are never you know trembly shaky and i was wondering like you know that, so then that, that's why that stuck with me is because you know like the, the the camera in my dreams is stable <laughs> <laughs> right so i i think that should, should we do the the thing that i pitched to you guys the textual read the yes. interpret free and the yeah, absolutely. Read? okay so i i think that that could be helpful so what i want to do was just kind of go through and talk about or at least recap what literally happens on screen and mm-hmm. then we can talk about how to interpret that because th- there is a pretty, I think, standard way to interpret the events of the movie. Yeah. Um, and I think mm-hmm. the, the movie gives you a lot of clues as to how to do that. And then the third way we can talk about it is analytically where we kind of engage the metaphor. If we can yeah. agree on the metaphor, I'm assuming we can. But um, actually, I have I have Mulholland Drive on mute in front of me right now watching and the winky scene is about to start. So I'm like, <laughs> I have one eye on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, Grizz, as you just said, it opens on like a jitterbug contest, but it's it's kind of it's, there's something off in that it's yep. it's it's people dancing in front of a a front of a purple backdrop, but like their shadows, like their the dancer shadows are also like cut out of the purple backdrop, so it's like yes. people dancing in front of their shadows, and sometimes and, people are dancing within the shadows, and some people dancing within the shadows, yes, and then it, that's kind of superimposed over. Um, Naomi Watts, a character we later learn to be to call Betty, uh, kind of standing mm-hmm. in front of like a spotlight, and there's applause happening. She's being cheered. Again, she's probably on yep. stage somewhere. And then these two elderly people appear beside her, and um, this is all before the credits. And then it cuts from that to a first person point of view of someone going to sleep, putting their head down on uh, red sheets, a bed with red sheets and a red red pillowcase. And then uh, we get the shot of Mulholland Drive, the road sign, and then the title sequence with uh, basically following the limo, as Chris just said, through Mulholland Drive. And I want to mention that um, David Lynch did release a um, 10 clues to unlock Mulholland Drive. And if you bought the DVD in like the early 2000s, there's a little insert that had, had his 10, 10 clues. And one of the clues he gives is, uh, pay attention to the beginning of the film. At least two clues are revealed before the credits. And um, mm-hmm. I believe those two so, clues are the head, the head the down pillow. on the pillows mm-hmm. and uh, something about the jitterbug contest and uh, the appearance of the elderly couple with Betty slash Diane. Um, regardless. So uh, that's that's what happens for the credits. And then uh, this woman, this brunette woman, Laura, Laura Herring, uh, who we later learned to call Rita, is uh, in this limo on Holland Drive. The driver's attempt to kill her but are stopped by a car crash and as roger eber points out like the the kids that are like drag racing on mulholland drive that crash into the limo they're driving like old 50s style cars yeah and 
he he makes the he draws the connection between those kids drag racing and the jitterbug contest because like he he thinks he, I'm not sure if they're the same actors but the way they're dressed and the fact that they're driving like 50s cars having just danced in like a 50 style jitterbug contest he kind of like connects that dot I, I never had before but I thought that was interesting um anyway the brunette woman is um she gets amnesia from this car crash she wanders down the hill uh from the Hollywood Hills into Hollywood and like basically finds an empty apartment more or less as a woman is leaving the apartment uh Grizz what do you got I just wanted to say this is one of those things that I uh, probably upon a rewatch that would have meant more to me the the jitterbug contest and the way that they're, the kids are dressed and the cars they're driving but at the beginning of the movie, not knowing what the movie is yet, I'm now just left with this is the time period the movie's in, and then I'm confused by it <clears> not <throat> being that time period. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she, Laura Herring, again, who we later learned to call Rita, uh, wanders down from the side of the car crash down the hill, um, crosses over a few... It, within the first, like, two minutes of this movie, there's, like, three specific street signs of Mulholland Drive, Franklin Avenue, and Sunset Boulevard, which are three, Sunset like, Boulevard, major yeah. roads in L.A., which I think that was cool. Um, and one's well-known from movie history as well. Yes. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of want to talk about why this is called Mulholland Drive. We can save that for a little later. Um, basically, I'll, I'll speed this up. So, she has amnesia. She finds herself in this empty apartment that is later lived in by this blonde woman that we call Betty played by Naomi Watts. And Betty is there, uh, had, had just come to Los Angeles from Canada to try to be an actress. And she's very bright eyed and bushy tailed as we talked about earlier. And, um, very aw shucks and, and golly gee. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And so she, uh, I think that the main plot line for the first two hours is, uh, Betty and Rita trying to put piece together, what happened to Rita and who she is, like what her identity is. Um, mm-hmm. But other things happening is uh, the other main storyline is uh, Adam Kesher is a film director played by Justin Theroux. And he is trying to cast a movie, but is being undercut by the shady mobsters. Uh, one of whom is Cher's dad from Clueless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, Basically, his movies control of his movies being taken out from under him. And this is no are, longer your film. This is no longer your <laughs> film. This is the girl, uh, and the cappuccino, <laughs> and um, there are these weird, shady, you know, backroom deals happening, and these guys pulling strings that we don't really fully get a good sense of. But like, I think the point is someone else is in control and not the director Adam, and he mm-hmm. has to he has to meet a cowboy <laughs> at one point. Yep. And his wife is cheating on him with Billy Ray Cyrus. And a lot of misfortune befalls him repeatedly. And control of his movie is taken from him. That's kind of the point there. And other things that happen is uh, there's an assassination attempt that, like, clearly has something to do with the car crash, I think. Like, this this hitman is discussing the car crash that, that we saw at the start of the movie. And then he shoots the guy, takes his book, and then has to shoot two other people in order to get out of the building in a very farcical scene. And, um, yeah, I think the point there is it's sort of just they're doing something to cover up the the yeah. the, the fact that you know there's this shady organization that's trying to take control of, of movie productions, I guess, and also and, and that also there's a there's a tie into what the attempted assassination or attempted murder mm-hmm. of Laura Herring, uh, the read character in, in the limo. And then I guess the third thing is is the Winkies thing, uh, which is this standalone ish scene at a diner where two two men or one of the guys who's in in a lot of other movies he's in yeah, like I looked old it up. school patrick fishler is the patrick fishler is the name of the he's, actor he's in old school what else is he in i know him from old school and some other stuff i, I know him from uh, the recently he was in the disney plus tv show the right stuff he was also in uh an episode of the west wing he was in mad men Mm. Uh, uh, Lost. He was in Lost as well. That's right. Which yeah, I, yeah. I thought was interesting. How many people are in this movie that were also involved with Lost in one capacity or another? Because Lost is also mm-hmm. very Lynchian in its weirdness. Was there anybody else <laughs> who was in Lost that was in this? Oh, uh, there. Uh, well, yeah. So uh, I'll continue on. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up again. <laughs> so the scene at Winkies is notably it's the last scene we see before. Betty is introduced. So we have like the limo scene and then we have, uh, you know, Laura Herring wandering down the hill into the empty apartment. Mm-hmm. 
and then we see the mobsters Director. for the first time. Yep. And then we see the winky scene, and then we get Betty's introduction. So the last thing we see before Betty's introduced to the movie is the winky scene. And the winky scene is basically just jump scare. Patrick Fischler, that actor, is meeting with his friend saying that I've had a dream about this place. And he doesn't really explain what the dream is, minus just a feeling that he has, like this feeling of dread and terror. And he says it's the person behind this place is causing it. And again, he's kind of speaking in vague terms, but they they go behind the winkies to the dumpster and there's a uh, homeless person there who, again jump scare kind of and uh, patrick fisher like collapses and dies presumably of like a heart attack or something like that yeah what do you got chris well so i I was one of the ones was uh the the hitman joe is also in Mm. lost uh Mm. and then the other thing that i i i kind of uh combined some things there was that uh justin thoreau was in the leftovers with that is created by damon Damon lindelof yeah yeah who also was with Lost, so it's just a, a web of weird television. It's in the, the Lindelof uh, <laughs> web, yeah. By the way, have you guys seen The Leftovers? I, I watched the first no. season of it. Very, very yeah, weird. You gotta, very you gotta good. watch second and third season, man. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, big recommend. Um, so, so that's, I guess, the setup for the first two hours is uh, those pieces that I just kind of listed. And then what happens is, um, again, Betty is in los angeles to be an actress so she goes to an audition then afterwards she and rita okay back up uh rita and betty go to winkies which is the diner where we see the guy the scary homeless guy living in the back and while they're there rita realizes that the name diane means something to her because the waitress is wearing a name tag that says diane so she says that name diane selwyn i think that's that might be who i am so they look up diane selwyn uh call her get no answer then they go to her address and find a dead body in in the bed and so then at that point Rhea starts wearing a blonde wig to disguise her identity because she thinks she may be in danger then she and betty have sex and betty says that she's in love with rita in love with her yeah and then that night uh rita wakes up in the middle of the night eyes wide and says silencio over and over again and says no i banda no i banda yeah and she says i need you to go somewhere with me so at three in the morning, they get in a cab and they go to a place called Club Silencio, where uh, there's this odd show of sorts on stage where a guy says, no, I banda over and over again, saying that, like, you're hearing music, but it's all an illusion. Um, mm-hmm. There's not actually a trumpet. There's not actually a clarinet. A guy playing the trumpet comes out on stage, seemingly playing the trumpet, then reveals he's not playing the trumpet. That's just all re- a recording. And then um, Rebecca Del Rio comes out on stage yep. and sings uh, a Spanish a cappella cover of Roy Orbison's Crying. And mm-hmm. much like the trumpet player, at some point she stops singing, but her voice continues because, yeah. again, it's all an illusion. It's not real. Uh, notably, during this scene in the audience, Rita, I'm sorry, Betty starts shaking uncontrolled. Yes. Yeah. And, and crying. And crying. They're both crying. Rita and Betty are both crying. And then the dream is collapsing. <laughs> right. And then at that point, Rita reaches into her purse and finds or who who finds the blue box? Someone finds the blue box in their purse. Is it Rita or Betty? I thought it was Rita. Uh, I think I think we see the blue box uh earlier as well. Um don't we see, see the it key the first earlier. time? We see yeah, okay, yeah, we see the key, but then she finds she opens the blue box and then now they're gonna use the key. Let, to... let me back up. Yeah, so in, in yeah. Rita's purse, when they're looking for clues to her identity, they find nothing but a bunch of money, like hundreds of dollars, mm-hmm. maybe thousands, and also yep. a blue key. That was the only thing that was in Rita's purse. And then at Club Silencio, like an hour and a half later or something like that, they find a, a blue box that has a little indentation indicating that uh, the blue key that they found earlier would open the blue box. Then they leave Club Silencio, and they go back to the apartment to basically find the blue key to open the box. But as soon as they get the blue key out, Betty has suddenly disappeared, and it's only Rita alone in the house. Mm-hmm. She opens the blue box with the key, and then Hugo, as you said, the camera zooms in to the blue box, and then the movie is completely different. It's yep. a, yep. To, to quote Fight Club, it's called a changeover. The movie continues on, and the audience has no idea what happened. Um Suddenly, we're alone in the apartment. There's no one there. And uh, the woman that we saw leaving the... I need to back up again. So, 
Betty is living in this apartment because it's allegedly her Aunt Ruth's apartment. And Aunt Ruth is leaving, so Betty is staying there. And we actually see Aunt Ruth leave at the start of the movie. Uh, Rita sees Aunt Ruth leave. That's why she knows the apartment is empty. And that's why she sneaks in there to, to sleep after her car crash. So mm-hmm. after the blue box is opened, about hour 55 in, uh, Rita and Betty are both gone. But Aunt Ruth is now at this Indie apartment pun. again. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think it cuts to a different apartment. Yep, uh, that we've, apart- seen before, we've seen before, though. It is the apartment where it's the apartment they, that... they went to look for Diane Selwyn and found a dead body. So it turns out it was her apartment all along. And we see Naomi Watts, notably in the same sleeping position, in the same bed as the dead mm-hmm. body they found. She wakes up and yep. uh, is not Betty anymore. She's a different person. Her hair is different. Her makeup is different. Her clothes are certainly different. Her apartment's different. And now she is Diane. She goes Diane. by the name Diane. That's what people call her. She is Diane Selwyn, um, the woman that they found dead. And um, I guess the last half hour is uh, nonlinear, where uh, no. we have some some flashbacks to Diane slash Betty, Naomi Watts, Diane, having some kind of romantic trysts with Rita, Camilla, Camilla or which her, her is, name is now Camilla, it turns but out it's Camilla Rhodes. It's Laura Herring. Yes, the actress who played yep. Rita in the first two thirds is now going by Camilla, and mm-hmm. they had some kind of romantic encounter, and Camilla at some point broke it off, uh, much to the dismay of Diane slash Betty, and um, we see Diane slash Betty in a limousine on Mulholland Drive, m- completely mirroring the opening scene. Uh, yeah. in every way even the and dialogue is the same dialogue's the same exactly uh, the, the cinematography is the same and um she's met on Mulholland Drive by Camilla slash Rita and she leads her up the up the hill to a house where there's a party at director Adam Ketcher's house Justin Thoreau and um there we kind of learned that Diane is a struggling actress and that Camilla is a successful actress and they met at an audition for um, the movie that Adam was making in the dream sequence for the first two hours. Like, they met on the set of that movie. And uh, basically, at this dinner, the director, Adam, and Camilla announced that, are about to announce that they're getting married or something. And so, out of in a fit of jealousy, uh, Diane hires a hitman to kill Camilla. And that she it's hires really good him. Cut. It's a really yeah. cool there's there's a really cool cut here where she's looking angrily towards Camilla and then there's a loud noise and she turns around and there's a jump cut and a match cut to of her sitting in the diner talking mm-hmm. to the hitman who's she's hiring to yes. kill off Camilla and it's notably the same hitman from the dream sequence yep. from the first 2 hours um and even though he was farcically incompetent in the dream mm-hmm. sequence he's Seems pretty competent. Yep. Nouns. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and he tells her, you know, once you pay me, there's no going back from this. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, which is, of course, setting up the regret that yep. uh, yeah. Diane is experiencing. Yeah, there, there's there's a few things in this. Th- this is like a 30-second scene where she hires a hitman, but it's yeah. very, very dense. The number of things. Number one, uh, he says, when it's done, you'll see this where I left it. And he holds up a blue key. And so he basically yep. says the blue key will be the indicator that I killed Camilla and the job is done. And like 10 minutes earlier, when she first wakes up from her fever dream situation, there is a blue key sitting on her coffee table. So that has taken place after she hired the hitman. So number one, he introduces the idea of the blue key being like the indicator that Camilla is dead. And that's obviously meaningful given the prominence of blue keys in the first two thirds of the movie. Number two, uh, she shows him a bag of money she has to pay him. And it's very clearly the same money that Rita had in her purse in the dream sequence. Number three, uh, Diane sees that the waitress at Winkies, who's the same waitress that sparked Rita realizing the name Diane Selwyn is meaningful in the, in the dream sequence. This is the same waitress that, uh, Diane and the hitman have at Winkies and her name is Betty in the dream sequence, yep. which indicates uh, kind of the transference of identity between Diane in real life Naomi Watts and the Betty character that she plays in her dream. Number five, uh, Patrick Fischler is also mm-hmm. here and he's uh, standing at, there, standing there uh, in the same manner and location that he described uh, in his own scary dream, dream. with the guy behind yep. Winkies. Uh, she sees him there. Um, 
And finally, she she yeah she gives over a headshot, an actress's headshot, headshot yeah. that says Camila Rhodes, and she said she says this is the girl, is the girl. in the same yes. way that mm-hmm. the mobsters were you know passed over the headshot for another girl who we also see I think in the dinner sequence uh, that said Camila Rhodes in mm-hmm. the dream she, they pass over a photo and say this is the girl yeah. so it's exactly the same way in which they are forcing the director to cast this Camilla Rhodes and that she gives a photo of this guy to kill her. Yeah, so Camilla Rhodes is, is Laura Herring in, in real yep. life. I guess we can say in real life, which is the last half hour, real life, quote unquote. <laughs> yep. uh, but there's also Camilla Rhodes in the first two hours in the, we'll call it the dream sequence, I guess. And that is the blonde actress that the mobsters want Adam Kesher to cast in the movie in the Sylvia North story. Mm-hmm. Um Notably, Camilla Rhodes is cast as a lead in the Sylvia North story in both the dream sequence and in real life, even though it's two different women. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in real life, it's yep. Laura Herring. In the fake dream, it's a blonde who doesn't really speak much. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what happens when she hires the hitman. So piecing it together, I mean, now we're... I mean, that's, that's I guess, the, the text. Well, last thing. Yeah, um, uh, wait, yeah. The, the final last scene, thing. Yeah, the final she scene. She completely, completely loses her mind, definitively even starts hallucinating these yes. creepy well, old men that we saw at the beginning. Okay, and I need to cover that. So when we Vega. first meet Betty, about 17 minutes into the movie, 17, 20 minutes in, mm-hmm. um, she, gets, she hops off the plane at LAX with her dream in a cardigan, and she is <laughs> <laughs> accompanied <laughs> by... Pretty sure she is literally wearing not, yeah. not a cardigan, but a sweater. Yeah, um, yeah. she's accompanied by an old couple, Irene and Irene's husband, some other some, some other old guy. Dude. Yeah, and um, basically we're we're led to understand that they just met on the plane and became like best friends <laughs> just on their <laughs> five hour flight from Ontario to Los Angeles, and um, uh, they they depart, they hug goodbye, they wish each other well, and then yep. um, after Betty gets in her cab to go to Havenhurst to her aunt's apartment. We see a shot of the old couple, Irene and her husband, in the back of a car, and they are smiling maniacally. They are creepy as all get out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And and creepy kind of patting each other on the leg. And I think that's there to indicate that something is off and something is yep. something sinister is afoot. And mm-hmm. we don't see those two again until the very, very end of the movie, where uh we see a shot of the man behind Winkies, the mm-hmm. homeless man behind Winkies. He's holding the blue box that Rita found in her purse in Clips on Theo that, that she opened to unlock the dream, basically. Uh, he's holding that box. He drops it. And out of that box come the old couple. They come, like, scurriously. They scurry out of the box. And then suddenly at Diane's house, she is, uh, like, accosted by the old couple. And, like, there's lightning mm-hmm. crashes. And the score is booming. And, like, there's a lot of point of view shots of, like, the old the old couple, like, trying to, like, reach and grab at yeah. diane and, and she's laughing and they're like laughing the whole time laughing maniacally she's screaming bloody murder if there's a handheld shot in the movie i think this is it yeah this is the shaky yep. handheld Again, i think i mean yeah the shaky cam was what i, was I understand, more referring I understand, to I understand. Than... <laughs> right in terms of terminology um and then uh basically uh this old couple um she's, they don't, they don't she force just her to really... kill herself but she no, no, gets, no, she's just terrified she by them, and she, she starts, she, she has this huge scream to the camera, and then she runs away and finds a gun in, in her gun, drawer and kills herself. Puts in her and mouth, kills in herself. the drawer, we also see the blue box again. Hmm, I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah. And uh, so she kills herself in the bed, and... Um, and then lies there in the same fetal position that we're, we're we getting have into, seen the... We're, we're getting into interpretation at this point, but it, the, I think yeah. the implication is that she's the dead body that they found. Yeah. I mean, it's the same apartment. It's the same bed. She's lying in the same fetal position. You're right. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's like what literally happens is, yeah. is, is all that stuff. And we, we kind of already gotten into the interpretation well, element, it, it, but there's one, a final scene. What is that? Where back in club silencio, the blue haired oh, woman yeah. is saying silencio. <laughs> yeah, she does. That's true. And that's how um, it ends. And we also, and we also see, sort of flashing images of su- some stuff that's happened in the movie. And I think the final, final thing we see is actually that it's sort of a superimposed shot of um, Betty and Rita in the blonde wigs. Yes. And it's sort of strange and weird. I 
honestly, I think the the wig thing and the shot that we see at the end of them together, it's very reminiscent of Persona, a movie that we've yeah. mentioned on the podcast before. It's, it's clearly a point mm-hmm. of reference for, mm-hmm. for this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and that I think that's the final thing. It's almost as if seconds after she shot herself, the, the final thought that, that maybe she has in her mind is, is of that part of the dream or something like that. So... Again, we kind of already danced around like what the interpretation of these of this mm-hmm. this is, and that is that Naomi Watts is a woman named Diane, who yep. ba- basically everything she says at the dinner scene about two hours ten minutes in at Adam Ketcher's house ev- that's I think we're supposed to take to be factual in that she yep. it's not that her aunt Ruth is letting her stay in this apartment. It's that Aunt Ruth died and left her a bit of money such that she was able to come. She won a jitterbug contest in Ontario and was able to come to Los Angeles thinking she could be, she could parlay jitterbug into being an actress, I guess. I don't know if that was yep. a good plan, but yeah, that's, that's how jitterbug uh, works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I know that every, every agent and casting agent in Los Angeles is, is crawling over jitterbug contest winners to try to find the next big <laughs> yeah. thing. I know that's yeah, what see this girl jitterbug. He's going places. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the 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 real the reality of the story is that Diane came to Los Angeles to try to be an actress, and she meets this woman Camilla Laura Herring on the set of a movie, and Laura Herring gets the part, and Diane doesn't get the part, and they be they begin this romantic relationship, and then Camilla is done with Diane at some point, either because she gets too successful, or and Camilla, and Diane's kind of a loser. Or for some other reason? From Diane's point of view, it's basically because she is sleeping with the director and goes on to have a relationship with the director. But of course, Diane is not objective as a narrator there. Unreliable narrator. Yeah, it's sort of her (laughs) interpretation of uh, why Camilla left her is that uh, not that she was a better actress and she got the part and therefore she met the director and they fell in love, but because... The director, without in well, in the dream, the director is forced, but I think in reality, Diane believes that Camilla got the role over her because she is sleeping with the director and she wasn't. And it's it sort of the whole dream thing is both her, I think, reconciling herself with the guilt of having killed this woman, who at one point at least she did love, and at the same time, the big jealousy that she feels towards this woman. So she she creates this dream world. And if you listen to David Lynch, a dream world is basically a movie in which she casts herself as sort of the bushy eyed girl that she was when Mm -hmm. she got to Hollywood. And Mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a role that where she is extremely, you know, amazing at acting. Cause we see that, 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 that scene where she, she does acting in the dream and she's brilliant and she gets the role and in which the reason why she's not getting the role in the movie is because there's some sort of shady organization with Italian mobsters that are controlling, uh, you know, the director's choices. And at the same time, the rest of it is her trying to... It's almost as if her subconscious is trying to break this dream reality to make her face the actual reality of what she did in the real world, which is have Camilla killed, despite the fact that at one point she did love her. Are we getting into interpretation here? Yeah, we're we're jumping around a lot. You just you just gave yeah. gave us a lot of stuff to talk about, Hugo. But go ahead, Chris. No, I, so, I'm just saying that's I think the big general. Uh, so what the movie is. So your interpretation here is that the dream sequence that we got at the beginning is all takes place in the last moment of her consciousness after she shot herself. Uh no no I don't think no because so. we do see her. So then when is she having this and dream? then wake up? Well, so I I think that she hires the hitman. Mm-hmm. Goes to sleep and like the head hitting the pillow that we see is in one of the one of the first images movies. After movie she's hired is, the hitman, after mm-hmm. she's hired the hitman and she goes to sleep, and then she's awoken hour fifty five later by a knock on her door and it turns out to be her neighbor yep. who she switched apartments with. And right. then we see the blue key. So yep. my interpretation is she hires the hitman, goes to sleep, has this huge fever dream, and then wakes up and the key is there. Gotcha. Yep. And and Camilla's and the dead. key signals okay. that. Yeah. yeah, and it. I think I find it interesting just on a so, film level that the dream itself feels more, almost more um, structurally linear than the reality. Like when we get to the real world, it jumps around all the time. We see images yeah. that are completely out linear. of reality. Yeah. And it it's almost as if to say in the dream, she's creating a reality that makes more sense to her. But then in the reality, she isn't able to understand her own reality. And 
her mind is so fractured by jealousy and guilt that it sort of the way the movie jumps around backwards and forwards into different scenes is the same way that she feels in her head. So the reason I was asking when when is the dream taking place is because in the dream they discover a dead body in exactly the same position that she eventually is in after she mm-hmm. has killed mm-hmm. herself. And mm-hmm. so that's why I was like, is this dream, like how does she know to put the dead, bo- how, do, how does her subconscious know to put the dead body in the dream in that position if that's, she hasn't actually killed herself yet? And, um, that's where I think the, just the David Lynch of it all comes in, where okay. he... I think the symbolism and the imagery is more important, more important to him than the actual narrative than than the actual timeline. narrative making complete sense in in on that level. I think. Um, okay, so I didn't miss anything there. I, I just no. <laughs> it, it is the way it is. It, it it wouldn't make sense chronologically, but it ultimately would it would make the movie. But the, for the, for this movie, movie it's good. more important yeah. about the feeling it evokes than yeah. the actual story being told. Exactly. I think that's the only reason, really. Okay. And also, like, how how Rita in particular reacts to that, um, mm-hmm. I thought was interesting. And, like, what that discovery leads to. Like, it's actually that discovery that leads to them having sex, for example. is like, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, and, and her wearing the, the wig that makes her look like Diane, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't know. Uh, you're, you're right, though. Like, that is a bit out of, out of sequence um, that they would find the body mm-hmm. like that. I agree. But... Um, so hold on, Hugo got into a lot of stuff. Yeah, in so that, go ahead. In that yeah, dive spiel. into some of so, that because I'm sure it'll trigger something for me again as well. <laughs> um, so Hugo, I think like like you said, this the the explanation of the movie or the most common explanation of the movie is that the first hour fifty five is a fever dream, basically a mm-hmm. guilt induced fever dream from Diane uh, as the guilt for having her lover killed, and in this fever dream, it's basically. Um, it's an aspirational thing of like what she wishes could have been, you know, and she sees herself the way that, you know, she wishes others would see her basically, which is this idealistic, morally upstanding, um, Mm -hmm. nice person that everyone Mm -hmm. likes. And that is also an immensely talented actress. Uh, like you said, there's a scene where she's, she has an audition and she Mm -hmm. runs her lines with Rita in their kitchen. And it's a really badly written scene. Like it's really wooden, and yeah. she, she she plays it fine, but like it's it's bad just because the writing's bad. And then she goes to the audition and plays it completely differently than the way that we saw her rehearse in the kitchen. And she's fucking dynamite, amazing, yeah, she's really good. incredible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's incredible. And uh, she's she blows everybody away. And the casting director, the director, like they're all just blown away. And um, so much so that the casting director takes her to uh, the casting of the Sylvia North story because she wants betty to meet adam the director and uh it's there that adam like casts camilla rhodes instead instead of he before he even gets a chance to meet betty he says this is the girl Mm -hmm. about camilla rhodes which as you said hugo is probably betty kind of justifying in her own head why her career didn't go the way that she hoped it would in that it's that it's not that diane selwyn isn't a talented actress it's that someone else is pulling the strings and making things happen and a number of other things that happen in the dream that kind of like are a reflection of like the world that Diane wishes would exist, even if it doesn't actually exist. It's that not only is it are the strings being pulled in Hollywood by shady people and therefore it's not a meritocracy. So therefore Diane's failure is not a result of her poor acting ability. It's from something else, but also the people that have tormented Diane in real life are getting shit on in this dream yep, world, which right. is Adam where Adam is the director who did not cast Diane in the movie, instead cast Camilla, and then, in Diane's eyes, stole Camilla from her, romantically mm-hmm. speaking. Uh, yep. in, in the dreamscape, he's cuckolded. His wife is cheating on him with Billy Ray Cyrus. He gets beat up by Billy Ray Cyrus. And he's also being pushed around uh, professionally. He's, he's getting personal and professional failures because the control of his movie is taken from him, and he's... He's undermined in every sense of the word, in every aspect of his life, financially, professionally, personally. Um, I think it's notable that, like, Billy Ray Cyrus beats up Adam Kesher, but then Billy Ray Cyrus himself is beaten up by the Shady Italian Monster guys. It's kind <laughs> yeah. of like a transfer, like a transference of who has the most power and, and who's pulling the most yeah. strings. Um, 
And then the other the other person that we see bad things befell them in the dream sequence is the hitman. Because what Diane is kind of working through in her dream is because she's regretting hiring this hitman, what she's dreaming in an idealized world is that the hitman sucks and fails at his mm-hmm. job. And so therefore, when she wakes up, Camilla will still be alive and the hit will have yep. been poorly done. And that's we see that twofold. Number one, there's a botched hit on Rita in the opening scene of the movie. So like that's that the first thing Diane dreams is that Camilla Rita survives the hit that she just yeah. put on her, basically. And then later we see the actual hitman that Diane hired in real life. We see him in the dream and he again is really bad at his job. So that's kind of the He did the kill ways. everyone he everyone he encountered. They, they, he did kill it. I mean, he he was three for three. <laughs> three or really, three. intentionally uh, three for one because he was only supposed one, to be yeah. one. <laughs> he got three and then set the fire alarm off with the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> what a cool sequence! Mm-hmm. What a dumb sequence! And then, I guess the other big character that is recast in her sort of dream reality is Camilla herself, who, in reality, is this really independent, uh, talented woman who leaves her and you know ultimately is more successful than her professionally and in the dream she's recast as this this woman who not only has amnesia but ha- is on a character level is much more subdued much more passive and really needs very needy. diane yes very, very so. it really needs mm-hmm. diane and, and diane in real life w- would have wanted camilla i guess to be more like that it, it, we we do see some interaction between Diane and Camilla in the final 30 minutes when they were sort of still together or on the brink of leaving each other. And you can tell that Camilla is much... Kind of a relationship. Yeah, Camilla is much more of a strong character than she was in the dream. And also that Diane is almost a little abusive of her, uh, which is something uh, that we see, you know, when you know she's trying to force her, force mm, a sexual y- encounter y- with yeah, her on the yeah, couch. yeah. Like, yeah. It, you can tell the relationship is is just not going well, and Diane is is probably more at fault for it than Camilla is. Well, I think that so a couple things. So when Diane shows up in in the last third, when Diane shows up to the dinner, Camilla yeah. comes down from the house to Mulholland Drive and like leads her by the hand up the hill to the mm-hmm. house. Um, I think that's meaningful in a number of ways. Number one, like the movie began with. Rita, Laura Herring, descending down the from Hall and Drive into L.A. And now, two-thirds later, Laura Herring is leading Betty, Diane, up the hill from Hall and Drive into the house. And it's also, like, an ascension in, like, the movie world mm-hmm. in Hollywood. Like, they are literally climbing the hill to get to this director's house where they're having this fancy dinner. And it's, like, the successful actress leading the unsuccessful actress by the hand, pulling her up the ladder to get to this swanky Hollywood life, basically. And also, to your point, Hugo, like, the neediness, like, the, you know, who needs who. The dynamic who's, between who's guiding who is exactly is, the opposite. It's flipped yeah. in, in real life. And so it makes sense that in Diane's dream world, that relationship is the opposite. It's it's Rita who needs Betty and not Diane who needs Camilla, basically, to use their actual names. Go ahead, Chris. But we did also talk about how even when we're looking at the actual events of the real world, that... Diane is still an unreliable narr- narr- narrator. That she's, you know, I think so, yeah. So that leads me to question: even in the last, you know, thirty minutes of the movie, is all of that actually how it's happening, or is she? Because we see that she's she's losing her mind. Even in those moments, how much of that is actual? Actually, what happened? How much? How much can we believe those events? So I think um, when you see an event that is just, for example, her hiring the hitman, I think that's sort of an objective point of view. But when you go to the memories, so certain scenes with Camilla, certain interactions like that, and the dinner scene specifically, I think it's very much sort of her own interpretation of a memory that she has of it. Because I I think it's very... The way Camilla and the director act is almost as if to spite Diane. Yeah, and I think it's, that's very it's much very her much point in of her view. face. You know. Yeah, it's very much her point of view. They look at her laughing, and they even the way they announce their engagement is They're is very over the to top. Themselves. It, yeah, yeah. It's, that's not really how people act. And I, and I think she is, Diane is reliving that memory, but giving sort of some intentionality to what they did that maybe wasn't there necessarily. 
Josh, you looked like you disagreed with some of that. I kind of do disagree. I think that everything hmm. we see after she wakes up at the hour 55 mark, I think everything we see after that, right. I, I take to be real, real life. Mm-hmm. And um, it, no, it I mean, may be... I, again, I, I think all of those things actually happened, but the sort of the point of view in those moments is always still Diane. Yeah, so I mean, maybe... them from Diane-colored glasses. Yeah, yeah so like, exactly. It's, it's heightened. The, the director <laughs> it's heightened. and yeah. Camilla... Uh, the director and Camilla are almost villainous when they announce their engagement. Yeah, and I don't I mean, think maybe in you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean the 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 cruelty the cruelty aspect that that you see there is, is certainly heightened because we're seeing it through mm-hmm. through her eyes. Yeah. But I also like I, I buy everything that happens there and like yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe Camilla is being kind of cruel. I mean mm-hmm. she probably almost certainly is. And that's why she. Yeah, I mean that man. she did she did sort of invite her ex girlfriend who was really unsuccessful and who already is jealous of her and codependent a dinner yeah yeah and codependent to a dinner where she was going to announce her marriage to somebody else and where yeah. she also kisses another woman yes so yeah um grizz did you is there anything in the last third that you think might not actually be real is that was that well what so that, that's what i was what i was getting at is that i i start to question is any of it real because mm. we, we see that her descent into madness here uh, so, and that combined with her having already placed her dead body in the dream sequence, uh, before she would actually have been dead, you know, leads me to question how much of any of this is real, even within mm. the, the timeline of the, the movie. And so like justifying it as, you know, David Lynch's approach to making films is to evoke feeling rather than necessarily to tell you specifically what is happening. I can see how for some people they would, you know, brush that aside because that's, you know, not the intent of the yeah. movie. But for me, well, it's, I'm, I'm left like, gosh, I, I really wish there was, you know, I wish I was more able to be more certain that I had grasped everything that I needed to grasp. Well, right. let me let, let me give you this as a possible explanation for the dead body thing, because it sounds like you're latching on to that a bit. Maybe Diane sees this dead body in her dream and then therefore kills herself because that's what she saw. Because that's what she saw in the dream. Like, cause, cause dreams, dreams can be at least, and I want to talk about this as like our closing topic, but like the, the, the idea of dreams, dreams as narrative and like the intersection of movies as narrative and dreams as narrative and like the stories we tell ourselves. Um, but also like dreams as an aspiration, like, one day I dream of being an actress, but also yeah. dreams as a reflection. Like, you know, the, the physical process of people dreaming is like kind of basically processing what happened to you that day, basically. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. it's in this in this case, dreams are both an aspiration because is the wor- the Diane, the dream we see for the first two thirds is the world she wishes existed. But it's also a reflection. It's like processing what she's done and trying her 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 consciousness trying to make sense of it and also like try to justify it and also you know it's 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 there's a lot swirling around here i'm trying i'm I'm kind of stumbling through it but so i guess for me the issue just comes down to like there's movies like under the silver lake Mm -hmm. where i'm Mm -hmm. left asking questions and i know that i'm left asking some of the right questions right and so i really Mm -hmm. liked under the silver lake at the end of mulholland drive i'm asking a bunch of questions but i'm not even remotely certain that i'm asking the right questions anymore right and so i think that's why i didn't enjoy this so much is because i don't mind a movie that wants to to leave you wanting to know more information but i would like the movie to have led me to know that i'm asking the right questions at the end that i'm asking about the right things and i just don't feel that with mm -hmm. all and drive let me see if i can talk about one thing in particular that maybe can convince you that there's more intentionality that you might okay. initially suspect. So let's talk about the winky scene, which is um, in some ways narratively a standalone scene in terms of the plot, but yes. not in terms of the theme, I would argue. And it's also mm-hmm. um, probably among the more famous scenes in the movie in terms of like the way that people talk about this movie, they talk about the winky scene a lot. So um, back which, which, like, which winky scene? The one with the... I'm talking about the one with the scary dude in the back okay, with gotcha. Patrick Fischler Patrick and the other guy that we don't really see again. Um, so again, it's kind of a standalone scene in terms of plot, but not in terms of theme is my argument. But uh, the significance of Winkies in like the actual plot is that Diane meets the hitman at Winkies, gives him yep. the money, gives him the headshot, and 
the key is introduced. So basically, the murder is established at the Winkies. Right. And um, let's let's work backwards. So that's like the that's the final time we see Winkies in the movie chronologically. As you watch, is her hiring the hitman. Uh, moving backwards about 50, 55 minutes into the movie. Diane, and, or I'm sorry, Betty and Rita go to Winkies to use the payphone to call the police to see if there's a car crash on Mulholland Drive. And, um, like, I think it's really clever the way that uh, Patrick Fischler, as they're going out behind the Winkies, there's a lot of POV camera. And, like, you see, like, the entrance sign on the outside of the Winkies and you see the payphone. And then those are the two signifiers that you're come in the back same place later. about half yeah. an hour later. Yeah, that you're in the same place. I think it's, it's good. So... That's where they investigate. That's basically where they be, where Rita and Betty begin their investigation into mm-hmm. Rita's origins is by calling the police from that place, and that's also where they have a waitress who's named Diane, and that triggers to Rita that you know the name Diane is meaningful. Um, and the first time we see Winkies chronologically is the the Winky scene that I want to talk about, and in that scene, uh, Patrick Fischler says. Um, I have a dream where I'm just I'm, I'm scared to death, and um, just my heart's beating so fast. And there's a man in the back of this place. He's causing it, and he doesn't really say what it is. I think it's more just that like there's a man that's personifying these horrible feelings of dread and terror that this guy's feeling. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think that if we want to get a little engaged the metaphor and get a little analytical, I think that it's like that homeless person back there is kind of representing the horrible repressed guilt that diane is feeling yeah. and so i think it, it it is sort of a physical representation manifestation of, yeah yeah of everything that she feels is uh horrible about herself yeah, um, I, and I the thought that's evil what I that she's done was that it was how she viewed yeah. herself mm-hmm. well also i think it's it's, I think it's, yeah. it's notable that the next time we see this homeless guy he's holding the blue box that unlocked mm-hmm. reality yeah and also coincidentally to, the, the homeless guy we keep talking about it was actually played by a woman. Yes, played by a woman. That's notable. So, um, yeah. maybe it's Diane. Maybe it's Diane herself, or the physical manifestation of yeah. Diane herself. Yeah. But so the, the blue box that the homeless woman drops, uh, the two old people come out of that blue box. Not only is that blue box kind of just basically keeping reality closed in tight, it, and it's yeah, only it, it's only of, when you open the box does reality come out. Yeah, it's not um, just reality. I think she she's basically locked away the yeah. evil that she's done. Yeah. And, the e- the evil of her holds this thing locked because yeah. she doesn't want to you know have to engage with that it, it's it's her subconscious psychologically it's her subconscious yeah. literally compartmentalizing reality and yeah. hiding it's it like, from her it it is sort of like in inception where when they are going into somebody's dreams to find some information they always say oh uh characters people subconsciously naturally create sort of a container put them in safes uh, yeah yeah, or a yeah. safe or something where they keep their most valued secrets or, or feelings or guilts. And, and it's sort of a similar thing, I think. So I think it's notable that this homeless person is the one holding this box in the movie. Yeah. And also, like, the two old people, her tormentors that lead her to kill herself, come out of that box. So, like, I think mm-hmm. that's meaningful. And then, so when Patrick Fissler says he's causing it, that's kind of, what I think, what he's getting at. Is that in Diane's subconscious, like, that's the that person is the manifestation of like the repressed guilt the reality the murder the hit everything and so of course patrick fischler is scared of that guy because you know diane doesn't yeah. want to don't doesn't want to face that reality and when confronted with it it kills her it yeah. kills patrick yeah. fischler when he's confronted by that reality and also i just have to mention just the the filmmaking on display as they walk behind the winkies again the editing oh. and the in the camera work as they slowly approach the dumpster and so... uh dude Dude, the use of the use of negative space. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say negative space, right? Yes. Just basically emptiness in the frame. Yep. So as they approach the dumpster, or the wall, the most most of the frame is empty, and that's because it's going to be filled in a second when that person slides into view, and it's it's how they set un- you up to know that something's coming. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. unbelievably tense, and just it, it it's is... wild how how effective it is. Yeah, I don't understand how they managed to make it so effective. And I guess the 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 sound, this say, droning the music sound well. that, the ominous that you tone. hear as well, is really good. And it, this, this, like, like I said, it's... I didn't love the music, but like that's because I find I find this kind of music is sort of cliche, uh, especially for mm. suspenseful things. 
because uh, that's how they do right. it all the time. You know, one ominous note that just that is held, and then yes, but jump scare. <laughs> but like to to do that in such a mundane location where it's just a diner and it's broad daylight, and it's just two people. Oh, I had a dream. I'm gonna walk behind this corner. Yeah. And to be able to create that feeling of dread in that such a mundane situation, I think it is is really good filmmaking. Um, but that's that's how I think that you kind of have to get a little interpretive and analytical to make sense of how and why this Patrick Fischler scene is here. But I think that mm-hmm. that's kind of what I got on it. Is well, I do that, appreciate yeah. that looking back on it, going back on it step by step, like you just did, Josh, because at the end of the movie, I was feeling like, boy, that that really didn't feel like it was that important. But mm. uh, uh, going back, working at it in reverse, I, I can and it's kind of also, see it's a lot more It's important. also no coincidence that when when we see the real world scene of Diane hiring the hitman, she sees Patrick Fischler standing at the counter. And Making Patrick the scared Fischler face says, that he... Yeah, yeah. and Fischler talks, when he's in the dream, he, he says to his friend, oh, yeah, I, I remember sitting here and being really terrified, and I look over there and I saw you. And it's almost as if in the dream, Fischler is sort of another it's, it's Diane saying I looked over her, and I saw yeah, yeah. you and exactly. I saw yeah, him yeah. exactly mm-hmm. yeah and again no accident that Patrick Fischler in this scene says I have this dream that this is happening and Diane mm-hmm. this is happening in Diane's dream so again it's, it's just yeah. kind of introducing the thematic idea of a dream where you're scared and the person making you scared we later learn kind of to connect that person to like the reality and yeah. the tr- the repressed truth I think um, that's why I think that's a great scene. Not only is the filmmaking great and really effective to like kind of put you on edge and put you at dis, you know, unease. Um, again, that scene di- is directly followed by Betty's entrance to the movie. She hops off the plane mm-hmm. at LAX with a dream in a cardigan in the very next scene after Patrick Fischler collapses behind the Winkies. Um, so th- Grizz, to, 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 to your point, that's something that I've kind of put together after half dozen viewings that yeah. I kind of like. Yeah, I think it actually might even be easier to pull apart this movie if you watch the last half hour first, and then watch the first hour and fifty five minutes. That actually obviously you wouldn't would want to do that sense. the first time you watch the movie, but <laughs> no, but you know, like for example, you could watch Memento on YouTube in chronological order, and that yeah. kind of ruins the fun of the narrative, but like makes it makes probably make more sense it, to you. Clarifies, yeah. It, yeah. Um, I think you'd probably do that here too. Hmm. You could probably watch a chronological where oh, there's yeah. like. We could put like the final because, like you said, Hugo, the final half hour is not chronological necessarily. Um, so you could put the first half hour in chronology, and then basically have the dream sequence, yeah, and then have her kill herself at the end, and that would maybe make more make more sense. Because also, like uh, other characters pop up that aren't pop up in a dream that are that are different in real life. One of them being um, the landlord, Coco. Yeah, it's she basically casts people that she met that for some reason or another, uh, her mind connects to the events that happened in her real life that led to her killing Camilla. She sort of casts them in different roles inside the dream uh, just to create a reality that uh, she likes more, I suppose, or yeah. that at least fixes or pr- prevents her from having to deal with what she did. Yeah, and well, the, the scene where we actually meet Coco in real life is she's, she's Adam Kesher's mom, the director's mom, yeah. And she basically, she's not rude to Diane at she's the not party, nice. but she kind of like, yeah, she's, she's kind of like, yeah, she's kind of dismissive and um, kind of blames her for being late to the party and that kind of stuff. So like in the dream world, Coco is very, very pleasant, very accommodating, yeah. very sweet, very <laughs> friendly, kind of the opposite of how, how she was at the party. Um, anything else you guys want to, I, well, I want to talk a little bit about. I want to uh, do the analytical thing here. Yeah. But the last thing I wanted to ask was, uh. This movie's long. It's not not a short film uh-huh. by any means. Uh, mm-hmm. And going through this conversation, it does feel like a lot more of it needs to be there than I originally thought. Uh, there, mm-hmm. First thought, I was like, okay, we can cut out a lot of this stuff. But there's one part that still sticks out to me that, like, I don't know why it's there at all, and that's the police. What is the point of the police? Um, I think uh, it's either... Uh, well, uh, actually, I do think it's it just something else that she recasts from the reality. Because when she gets to reality, we we see the girl, the ex girlfriend of Diane's, who says, "Oh, you haven't given me my stuff yet." Who we see both in the dream and in reality. She she comes over and she says, "Oh, there was two detectives waiting, for, uh, looking for you." 
And it's almost as if there's two detectives that maybe are investigating the murder in real life. And then in the dream, she sort of reuses that idea of the two detectives to that are just investigating this yeah. accident that happened. They're not even it, the same detectives, uh, though. We don't know well, that. We, we haven't see seen the them. Yeah. We don't see them in, in real life. Oh, I guess that's right. Yeah, it the, is... one, the one in the, in the dream yeah. that we saw, the guys wearing the glasses weren't actually the detectives. They were just parked out front, right? I think I kind of agree that they may not need to be there, but I yeah. guess in defense of the story, like their purpose is to say that they know someone's missing from the crash because they mm-hmm. found an earring behind. Yeah. And so someone is missing. And I think shortly after that happens, we see like a series of phone calls by the mobsters mm-hmm. learning that someone is missing from the crash. And so basically the hit attempt and also, was unsuccessful. Uh, during the phone call scene, we see the final phone that rings that, is that, the phone. One, that one thing at a time. One thing at a time. One thing Diane at a time. Diane picks up. So one thing at a time. But, one thing at a time. <laughs> I also think it's just a kind of a narrative conceit that if you're watching the movie for the first time, you don't know that this part is all a dream. And so it is just sort of uh, tricking you into thinking that all of this is a narrative that is actually happening. And so there would be police on the scene of a, an oh, incident. They crash like that. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's kind of it's just setting up, oh, this is the central mystery and we are going to investigate it. And uh, I guess that's it. But so again, maybe I, I a agree. It's not a misdirection. Ne- yeah, it's not necessarily a super necessary scene in the movie. Well, uh, again, I think that you could say that that's there to show you that people learned that Laura yeah. Herring was supposed to be there and wasn't. And that's how the mobsters yeah. theoretically learned that she what the hit was unsuccessful. Uh, also, maybe David Lynch just wanted to give Robert Forster some work. <laughs> and he eventually yeah. would. We like he eventually Robert would Forster. in Twin Peaks The Return. He, he's, he's one of the main characters in The Return, so good for him. R.I.P. Robert Forster, by the way. So I mentioned the, the title, Mulholland <laughs> Drive. I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on why it's called Mulholland Drive. I have a few thoughts myself. Can I take a shot at this? Go for it. Is Mulholland Drive not like the last road in Hollywood? Like, out after that, you're you're no longer in Hollywood? So, let me give you some, yeah, some geography. So Mulholland Drive, basically, it weaves through the Hollywood Hills. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, um, Hollywood, quote-unquote, uh, yeah, you, you, I don't think Mulholland is in hollywood it might it might be like on the, on the edge of it but like basically you you know the east west thoroughfares that make up like the hollywood area and the west hollywood area are santa monica boulevard hollywood boulevard and sunset boulevard mm-hmm. and then once you go north of that you're in the hollywood hills um mm-hmm. and that's where like mulholland Mul- is yeah yeah exactly and it, it also runs east west but it's it's a weavier um that's how it, I, I had interpreted that though was that mulholland drive was a literal barrier for this dream hollywood well, it's interesting you say that because it, the Hollywood Hills are incredibly affluent. Uh, yeah. You're not going to find a home less than $3 million in the Hollywood Hills. Um, and so Mulholland Drive is also extremely affluent. The house you see in the movie right off Mulholland Drive is pretty representative of that of the kind of houses you see. If you watch Selling Sunset on Netflix, a lot of the houses they feature in that show um, are in the Hollywood Hills. Right. So yeah. there is – and I kind of already talked about you know Camilla leading – be, uh, Diane by the hand to this like it is kind of like an ascension but like like you said Grizz I think what you're getting at it is Mohan Drive could represent like the apex of success in some sense and like mm-hmm. financially and, and professionally in, in this in this uh, in this world um, it, the fact that it that it weaves through the Hollywood Hills in this, in this affluent area um, Hugo what do you got uh, I think Mohan Drive is basically a reference to the film Sunset Boulevard. Yes. Uh, I think the fact that both movies have a famous, you know, Hollywood or Hollywood Hills street as their name, and they're both films about Hollywood and how it sort of chews up these female actresses and spits them out broken. Both Um, certainly about regret. Also about about regret. Also about people losing their minds. It's it's very much. They even a, directly quote Sunset Boulevard in this movie. They do. Yeah. They also <laughs> they directly quote Sunset Boulevard. They show Sunset Boulevard at one point. Um, mm-hmm. the, the the road sign itself, and I just think that is part of it. And the other part is just that uh, I think uh, David Lynch had one of his ideas, and the idea that came to mind is oh. There's this dream world and Mulholland, the image of Mulholland Drive is something that he was thinking about. And if you listen to him speak about movies, he often just has an image in his head and then creates a narrative around that image. So I think both things are 
truth. I was just saying, it all it also would fit that Mulholland Drive is a winding road mm-hmm. with an you mm-hmm. know not a clear trajectory, and that kind yeah. of fits the entire narrative of this movie as well. So I mean, there's some Certainly. symbolism you could draw from that as well. I'm I'm most with you, Hugo, about the Sunset Boulevard parallel, and that both yeah. the title of Sunset Boulevard and the title Mulholland Drive are both supposed to evoke, you know, a feeling of hollywood history and um feeling of uh hollywood success probably um yeah. given like who lives on sunset boulevard in the movie sunset boulevard and who lives on mulholland drive in the movie mulholland drive but it's all they're both like tragedies in their own way too yeah um and again about regret and there's murder involved and an unreliable narrator and both uh mm-hmm. sunset boulevard opens with the dead body in a pool and the narrator is the dead body that's that's what that movie is <laughs> so um but yeah, I think I, that that's what I make of the title. I guess is is evoking that, but also like, which makes me brings me to my second question. It, it's like, why is this set in in Hollywood in in the movies? You know, and that's kind of what I was getting at earlier with like the idea of narrative and dreams and stories and how like dreams in some sense are like us narrativizing our own life. You know, mm-hmm. like dreams are the movies we watch in our head as we sleep, and yeah. you know. Um, I think that's interesting. I don't. I don't really know what to make of it. I don't have like a tying thesis to put a nice bow on this. <laughs> I was going to say it's because David right. Lynch is not overly fond of the Hollywood studio system. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's certainly I mean, part of it. He he definitely loves Hollywood. He lives in Hollywood. He Hollywood is prominently featured in in quite a few of his movies. He loves the idea. He likes what the Hollywood idea of be. the. He really <laughs> likes the a lot of classic films, but it, I think the narrative of the execs controlling everything and not letting the director has his, have his own vision is part of Diane's coping mechanism for her failure as an actress. But it's also David Lynch sort of commenting on his experience with Hollywood. Because if you know his career, he started out with films... Well, he started out with Dune, uh, which incidentally is coming out soon, uh, the new version, where it was an experience for him that he, that he hated. It was very much inside the Hollywood system and he had no creative control. And after that, he always worked on the fringes of Hollywood because he did make movies in Hollywood, but oftentimes he had funding from France, he had funding for, from England, and, you know, even this film itself, it was supposed to be a big TV show, a miniseries or something, and, you know, the executive rejected it, and he had to go search for funding outside of the Hollywood system to, you know, create what eventually led to the movie. So... I think there's definitely part of just him commenting on on the movie business and how broken it might be in his view. While yeah, also th- showing how, you know, dreamlike and beautiful it can be seen from the outside. Right. I, I think there's certainly commentary on, you know, who pulls strings, not just in Hollywood, mm-hmm. but just in the in life in general. But also, yeah. like, the idea that um, Hollywood is, like, the ultimate aspiration Like, the Mm -hmm. ultimate dream is to come to L.A. and make it in the movies. And so, like, if you're making a movie where a woman is dreaming about, like, how she wishes her life could have gone, it makes an awful lot of sense that she's this bright-eyed person who came off the bus from Ontario trying to be an actress. (laughs) Again, I don't don't have, like, I'm still working on my ultimate thesis to connect, like, the narrative of the dream versus the narrative of storytelling and and movies and um, how Diane says she, or Betty said she woke up in this dream place uh, very meaningfully Mm -hmm. to Rita um yeah I, I don't really know but that's that's what i'm working on still also again Grace. uh dreams in general big part of most of david inch's films he of course yeah very this attachment as a surrealist to, yeah yeah to this idea of of dreams as dream logic sort of a dream logic dream logic both like he sort of takes dream logic and turns it into film structure and the way his movies are edited this one specifically the way this movie is edited sort of mm, is the same as when you think back on a dream where it doesn't there isn't necessarily a logical gap between two things that happen in the dream and you sort of create those connections and i think a lot of his movies sort of try to do the same thing try to give you that feeling while also having to be you know a traditional movie can we talk about club silencio before we wrap up Mm and we can rank this yeah yeah what do you think about club silencio grizz i liked that scene uh, Me too. I, uh, the reason I like that scene is because that's the closest I think David Lynch comes to telling you what this movie's about. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It's all a facade. Yeah. So it's all an illusion. So I appreciate it. It's that. not real. Yeah. yeah. And 
it's also just you know very like a a fun scene in that you know it's it's a little nonsensical but yeah. uh meaningful at the same time uh, mm-hmm. which again is kind of the point of david lynch's movies so <laughs> yeah yeah just some of the again having seen this a lot now like i i latch on to some of the smaller details that i really enjoy like the fact that like there's at least like a dozen people in this theater, even though it's three in the morning and this yeah. like obscure avant-garde show going on. Like, why are there so many people there? Um, <laughs> and like, uh, I think that the Yorando song is amazingly beautiful and Rebecca Del Rio mm. is, is amazing in it. Um, and, th- but like you said, Grace, I, I like it most because it's, it's cluing you in as, as to the facade breaking down. Like hearing all this mm-hmm. stuff about illusion is making, diane betty shake like literally shake because her, it's it's reality cracking through hearing it's illusion it's an illusion over and over again is kind of making her realize mm-hmm. that none of this is real and then obviously the illusion breaks five minutes later even yeah. the fact that they even get to the club is um first we see them wearing wigs where i think it's a hint that both of them are figments of diane's imagination in some way and you they, they sort of get closer together and their identity sort of well, their identities start to merge like like in start persona to merge, like, you said, yeah. like in persona and then she just wakes up you know rita just wakes up in the middle of the night puts the wig back on and, and starts saying silencio silencio uh, no hay banda we need come to me to this place it's almost as if her subconscious is doing as much as it can to wake her up and make her face the What's reality she? that that she ultimately isn't able to face and the song itself is llorando por tu amor it says which is like crying because of your love so it it's say it's telling you once again that um diane was in love with camilla and she let anger jealousy and get and, and and sort of regrets at her failures get in the way of that and to the point where she even had her killed and that her crying and the lightning it's sort of this big realization of what she has done basically i really like that scene and I just, even just from a, a mise-en-scene uh, point of view, is just a really cool, weird avant-garde I scene that I yeah, enjoy yeah. just in itself, like even divorced from the rest of the narrative. But also so unsettling. So unbelievably it is. It's creepy as hell. And the yeah. man that they got to do it has this really creepy uh, gaze that he gives directly to the camera that I think mm-hmm. really fits the mood. Also, speaking of things that I just, you know small details i noticed on this most recent watch is uh the guy who runs the hotel the sleazy hotel that adam stays at after mm. he walks in his wife that's the guy that introduces rebecca del rio Club yeah. silencio ha. same dude yeah i didn't Cookie. i didn't i didn't notice that until like this most recent watch i noticed which... that and i was like but why i don't know what to make of that yeah i don't know i don't, <laughs> I don't really know um i don't know I... Again, I have Mulholland Drive on si- on mute in front yeah. of me, and like the scene right now of Cookie like talking to Adam Kesher at the hotel, he's like warning him, but mm-hmm. like th- they have like a an understanding together, but also like he's looking out for his his best interests in some ways. Um, I don't know, I don't know how that connects to bringing well, we Rebecca also, Del Rio on stage. What we also didn't talk about Sancio. is is the Midnight Cowboy, who he has to go cowboy, meet yes. <laughs> in yes. the ranch. And he just uh, gives him a little hint. Th- this is one of those moments that I on. think was just David Lynch throwing in a little classic weirdness for the sake of weirdness. <laughs> You're probably right, but also yeah. like again, extremely unsettling scene to me at least. Yeah. But like, kind of, it goes from unsettling to kind of funny very quickly, and then back because, again because Justin Theroux is sort of playing it as if as you would in real life, where this is so ridiculous that he's, he's not even scared it's not by ridiculous. it. He's like. <laughs> Okay, sure. Right. Well, yeah, that's no, what I, mean. I agree like, with you. Yeah. <laughs> as as he drives up and like the lighting and some of the some of the camera work, like I think it's very the score is very unsettling. There's a single mm-hmm. shot of like the steer skull and the light comes on over the steer skull and like I'm I'm nervous watching it. I'm freaked out and then the cowboy walks up and suddenly I'm not nervous anymore. Now I'm like laughing mm-hmm. and yeah. the first few yeah. things he says, I'm laughing, but then as the longer the conversation goes on, like the more sinister this becomes again. And so, like, it goes from, like, scary to funny to, like, creepy and sinister all in the span of, like, I don't know, 90 seconds, two minutes. Yeah, no time at all. Um, yeah, which I think is pretty remarkable. Also, like, I'm still trying to piece together what the cowboy means when he says, if you see me once, if you see me one more time, you did a good job. If you see me two more times, you did a bad job. We notably see him two more times. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he wakes up Diane from her dream. Time time to wake up or whatever. Rise uh, and shine. Rise and shine. And then, and then we then see, see him, him in the background. 
Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, it's almost, fact... I think it's just as if to say she did do wrong. She, I was going to say, she maybe did. that's telling Diane she like... did a bad job. Yeah, she did bad. Yeah. Because she killed. Yeah. Okay. Well, so just to kind of like wrap up our thoughts, you know, here, I will say this conversation has, I did enjoy this conversation a lot. And it, it hmm. is making me rethink some of my thoughts on the movie. So I probably will adjust the rating I gave it a little bit. Uh, it, it By no means do I love this movie now. But I love <laughs> talking about it with you guys. <laughs> it's, you know, I think it's one of those movies that whether you um, enjoy it or not is is very interesting to discuss. And, and sort of to have seen whether you end up really liking it or not. I don't know if you understand what I mean. Shall so we yeah, rank it? Should we yeah, rank I it? I think we need we need to we need to rank it. I forget uh I forget the math we've been using. We just because... sort of been averaging. We've been averaging. Right? Okay. Yeah. And then we'll do a re rank episode again later. <laughs> yeah. Well it's not uh, it's not very scientific, but I mean whatever. Number num- number one for me. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a number one for me as well. It's one of my favorite movies, uh from one of my favorite directors. So it, it just sort of shoots up the list for me. Based on my rating, it should be last. But uh, our conversation has made me rethink that some. And like I said, I'm going to adjust my rating on, on Letterboxd accordingly. But I would probably say for me, I still would have to put it at 26. Behind the Trial of Chicago 7? Yes. Okay. Which we've established, so, I like a lot, and you guys don't. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run down one through twenty-five. So these are the movies that Grizz puts in front of uh, Mulholland Drive. So we have Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Doctor Strange Love, Silence of the Lambs, Paddington Two, Shaun of the Dead, Boogie Nights, The Departed, Lawrence of Arabia, Citizen Kane, It's a Wonderful Life, Chinatown, Your Name, The Wind Rises, John Wick, Network, the Sound of Metal, Bicycle Thieves, Jackie Brown, Ensemble, Rudy, One Point Seven <laughs> Hours, Batman Mask the Phantasm. Another round, Mank, and the Trial of Chicago Seven, and then Mulholland Drive. I gotta say that's a, that's a, that's a list of some really good movies. Yes, yeah. movies that, that I don't think are as good as Mulholland Drive, but some really well, yeah, good movies <laughs> pretty good movies that maybe just fit your taste better. So, well, certainly they fit my whatever. taste better. But, so, uh, what would the average end up being then? Would you say you said twenty six? Yeah, yes, twenty six plus two is twenty eight. Nine point three. Then I guess 9. it would 3. be in front. I mean, of Citizen Kane. Yeah, we can put it in front of Citizen Kane. Okay, it's there going go. to <laughs> So it'll hang into the top drive. ten for a little while longer. Top it'll 10. probably be there... up there for a while. We're, we're like we, because of the way we've approached these, you know, episodes, we've done a lot of our favorite movies already, like our personal yes, favorites. Yes, that is true. So, like, eventually we're going to start delving into movies that we like, but don't immediately say, is this well, the best movie of all I time? I mean, that's kind of what I want to do, is, like, what, a movie that one of us remembers and likes and wants to talk yeah. about that doesn't get talked about as much, and maybe the other two aren't as familiar with. That's kind of what I want to move to. Yeah, and we are. Um, sure. Yeah, but before we do that, let's real quick recap the top ten, because it cracked the top ten. Uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Doctor Strange, Love, Sansa Lambs, Panda 2, Shaun of the Dead, Boogie Nights, The Departed... Larry of Arabia, Mulholland Drive, and Charles Foster Kane, a.k.a. Citizen Kane. Cool. Yes. That's Grizz, cool I believe list, it's yeah. your turn to pick yes. our next, so our, next FTR. our next film to remember is going to be John Favreau's Chef. Uh, Chef. Which, you know, is a very niche sort of film, and definitely not one that most people have seen, definitely not one that a lot of people talk about, but I... Really love it, and if you are a fan of food, this this is like good. Food. This is going to be a good movie for you. <laughs> I think the fact that you're going to put Chef ahead of Mulholland Drive is very telling about our respective tastes. <laughs> 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 Chef is a lovely movie. I look forward to talking about it, but I mean, we'll yes. talk about it next where, week. <laughs> where it would be in terms of my personal ranking, yeah, it would be higher because I, I I like oh, okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it too. Chef is a very lovely movie. Is it streaming anywhere at the moment? Let me check. I haven't seen Chef, so and that's uh, kind of the point. See how I feel about it. But it's lovely. I've only seen it once, sure and it was shortly after it came out. Now, this is one of those things that we're talking about, like rankings of like our personal feelings towards something that does I not know. necessarily. I get it. I know. You know, I just want to make sure for anyone listening, uh, namely uh, super fan TJ, who has <laughs> a lot to say about my thoughts on this. I'm sure. Uh, 
just because I didn't like the movie doesn't mean I don't see the merits of its filmmaking and, you know, things like that. It's just I just didn't enjoy it. And that's, you know, not, not a personal attack that's against completely fair. anyone. <laughs> so please don't personally I, I, attack me. <laughs> I feel personally attacked. Direct all your tweets at Good Game Grizz. No, no, no. Your mom <laughs> drop takes. By the way, guys, I, I changed my Twitter handle. Oh, did you? You did? I did, yeah. To what? I'm no, lo- I'm no longer at Brosh Jadley. Well, okay. What that's is it fine. now? Well, let's 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 do our, our end of the episode boilerplate stuff. Uh, please follow us at RTF underscore pod. Do not follow at RTF pod or at RTF underscore podcast. Those are our sworn enemies. We are at RTF underscore pod. Uh, follow Grizz. Uh, where can we follow you, Grizz? You can follow me at Good Game Grizz on Twitter and on Twitch. Also at Good Game Grizz. And you can Hugo. follow me at Hugo underscore Pinai on Twitter and on Letterboxd. I'm now at the Sloop Josh B, which is a reference to a Beach Boy song. The Sloop John, Sloop B. John B. So, at there you go. the Sloop Josh B, we'll see how long I have that. I might change it back to Brosh Jadley, but for now, follow me <laughs> at the Sloop Josh B, which is just a wonderful thing. It makes me smile every time I think about it. Um, <laughs> Great. And watch Chef, and yes. tune in again next week for another exciting episode of Remember the Film.